Okay. Yeah. Emote, emote, quiz, quiz, and quandape. Really good to see everybody this morning. Um, emote, uh, Richard uh, Namugui's uh, Hardy. Uh, my name is Richard Hardy. I'm the chair of the Electoral Area Services Committee. My Comox name is Namugui's. Um, before we get into the agenda, just want to remind folks again that uh, we do have emergency exits on the my left hand side and also on the right hand side uh, and we also have washrooms in the back and uh, just a reminder again with regards to uh, our delegations this morning uh, normally how things work with regards to delegations is somebody will come up and speak and they've gone through the process of submitting some type of a form uh, to our legislative folks to uh, have that opportunity to speak here uh, so just moving right into the agenda uh, again, uh, first is a recognition of the traditional territory of the Comox peoples and Palash peoples. And uh, I guess we'll get into item number B next, which is the delegations. Second. Thank you. So number one is the Couscous um, project. Caitlin, nice to see you again. Thanks for having me. Uh, would you like me to get started? Please. Perfect. I'll just share my screen here, folks. All right. Perfect. Are you all seeing um, the actual view, not the presenter view? We've got the notes view. We, we can okay. see the notes view, Caitlin. Okay. Let's just switch screens here. Is that better? Yes. Great, thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me today. Um, my name is Caitlin Perchelski and I'm the Executive Director of Project Watershed. I'm here today to uh, present about the Couscousum project. I'll be providing a project overview, um, give you a brief timeline of where we're at and where we'll be going in the next year or so, um, and also with a funding and in-kind contribution request. Um, so first, I'd like to note that this project happens on the traditional territory of the Comox First Nation and is carried out in partnership with the Comox First Nation and the city of Courtney. Uh, the site in question uh, was once originally a tidally influenced forest riparian habitat. Uh, this is the first aerial photo we have of the site uh, where we can actually see the original vegetation. Uh, this is the site in 1946. Uh, it just for a little bit of uh, feedback for folks, uh, the cardinal directions are switched. So this is south north rather than north south if, if the view is confusing for folks. Uh, the sawmill was developed in uh, 1949, this is a view of the sawmill from 1950. So at the beginning of its development, it was in fact in river level, which you can see here, um, and the river engaged directly with the site and the works happened directly at river, le river level there. The sawmill was developed in many stages throughout its history. Um, and what we can see in this next slide is kind of the end, the end development of the site in the late 90s, early 2000s. So you can see the large mill infrastructure at the north end of the site. You can see the log booms. You can see the log storage facilities and office on site and uh, the, the sawmill activities directly abutting the Hollyhock Flats uh, conservation area here. So when we bought the site back in 2020 and 2021 in partnership with the Comox First Nation and City of Courtney, this is what the site looked like. It was entirely uh, covered in concrete, all 8.3 acres of it, along with some asphalt. There was that old office building kind of down at the middle, middle of the site there. Um, and you can see the 400 meter long sheet pile wall uh, dividing it from the river. So that's where it was when we started. 
Um, this is a view uh, from across the river looking towards the Hollyhock Flats Conservation Area. And Hollyhock Flats Conservation Area is our reference site for the restoration of the work. And that just means that what we're looking to develop at the site in the future is the same similar vegetation communities that you see at Hollyhock Flats. So if you can just think about what it might look like 100 years from now, looking across the river, um, this is the view that you might actually see looking from Courtney over to the Coma side. So I just wanted to provide that for a little bit of context so that you can in your heads picture what the site may look like in a couple of years. The core project goals of the project are the restoration of the ecological values, the reconnection to the floodplain in the Courtney River, and the adjacent conservation areas, Hollyhock Flats, which we previously mentioned. Um, a huge paramount goal of the project is, of course, reconciliatory action and the rematriation of landscapes. Uh, as well, this project uh, aims to do climate change adaptation and mitigation by both sequestering carbon and mitigating the effects of climate change in the future, as well as providing providing us with some community resilience to those climate change effects. This is the restoration design of the site. So this is what we will be working towards in the future. This shows final grades. So what you'll see here is a berm along the back. Uh, and then as you uh, look towards the river from that, this dark blue line here is the high, high water mark. So during a high, high tide, Every, twice a day, you may see that the water level will actually cover about two thirds of the site. Uh, this is some deep water pool area. Oh, sorry, I should put my, there we go. This is deep water pool area here. This is a tidal marsh island. So all of the um, chosen values within this site are really um, have been chosen to uh, basically have the greatest impact uh, as far as the ecology um, and the functionality of the site. So these will benefit things, things like salmonids very specifically, but also uh, waterfowl, birds, and uh, many other species as well. This is just a brief infographic of what the site will look like um, restored. So in those upland areas that are kind of back along the edges of the site, you'll see some larger trees, conifers, um, specifically Sitka spruce, crabapple, red alder. You'll also see some uh, shrubby species like black hawthorn, twinberry, red osier dogwood. And then as you move from basically the upland area down towards the river, this is when you'll see some of those shrubby species uh, such as uh, sweet gale and hardhack. And then the farther you get down towards the river, that's when you really get into those tidal marsh species. So you'll be th seeing things like Lingby sedge, you'll be seeing Arctic rush, and some of those species that are really, really able to withstand uh, that diurnal wetting. Mm -hmm. So the timeline so far, um, in 2016, that's when the partnership team, so the partnership between uh, Comox First Nation, the city of Courtney, and Project Watershed was formed. In 2017, we entered into agreement with Interfor um, to hold the site for purchase for us while we raised the funds to purchase the site. In 2020 and 2021, we reached that final fundraising goal and were able to purchase the site. And once the site was purchased and the land was transferred, that's when we could initiate rest restoration, which happened um, which started in 2021. So the first step of that restoration was the hard surface removal. So that was the concrete and asphalt removal and recycling all across the site. In 2022 and 2023, that's when we started the recontouring and revegetation. And that's the stage that we are in currently. And we will be continuing that work into 2023, 2024. 2024 and 2025 is when we may see the steel piling wall removal. That uh, work has yet to be uh, concretely uh, scheduled, so we are waiting to see how the site develops and uh, revegetates over time before we go through with the wall removal. So the first step was the unpaving. I'm just going to share a couple photos for you folks to see. Uh, this was uh, breaking up that concrete, piling it, you can see uh, asphalt on one side and concrete on the other. Uh, a lot of metal was removed. Um, about 75 bins worth of metal was recycled from the site, which is a lot. This is the process of actually breaking that concrete up so that it can be repurposed. And all the concrete that was removed off the site was actually repurposed around the valley as structural fill and road base. That's just loading up of that concrete material. 
This is a un previously unknown concrete wall that we found along the 400 meter long sheet pile wall that was removed with the help of our contractors and also crushed up for offsite removal. This is the stage that you will see on site right now. This is the recontouring and revegetation stages. So we will work from north to south, recontouring the site to the final grades, which I showed previous. This is the planting stage. So you can he see here some of the species that we were planting. I think this might be a salmonberry, perhaps, and obviously some conifers as well. This was a planting effort that was undertaken in the fall. So this is where you see some of those Lingby sedge. And this is that tidal marsh area that we were talking about. So you can see the upland areas up here, this high berm here, and then all these areas that are lower lying. Those are the areas that will be tidally in inundated when that steel piling wall was removed. This is just another view of the site. We did see some extensive flooding of the site over the winter, so I just wanted to showcase how the site fared um, for the folks that may have seen that. It looks pretty catastrophic from the photos, but I actually want to reassure folks that uh, the site handled the water really, really well, especially in the areas that were recontoured. So if you actually look at it from this photo, you can actually see um, that even in that extreme flooding event where we saw the intersection of a king tide event and a rain on snow event, which is pretty extreme for our area, we actually still have about a meter or a meter and a half of um, elevation left over before the berm is overtopped. So this is um, basically showcasing that our climate change modeling and our sea level rise modeling has functioned really well um, to predict for these climactic events. So the site is uh, uh, really well recontoured to deal with these large flooding events. This is just a video for good measure. You can actually see the water coming in over the wall here. And so largely what we're dealing with now is actually removing that water from site so that we can undertake work once again. So the last stage of the work will be removing the steel piling wall. This is just a example photo of what that could look like. We'll be removing um, basically one section at a time, like you can see here. We're working with DFO, Current Environmental, Northwest Hydraulics, our engineers, and other qualified contractors to do, do the best removal methods. Um, we'll be removing it likely in the winter via a barge with a vibrating arm. We're currently in the process of undergoing all the permits to go through that, and there will be construction and environmental ma management plans in place to reduce um, any potential impacts to the river from that work and uh, the, the, folk, the, the little things living in the river, of course. Um, as far as an organization goes, we uh, work as a partner group with folks, elected officials and staff from both KFN and in the city of Courtney. We, we meet once a month to problem solve and work through the high level issues with, with the site and to uh, celebrate our wins as we work through the project. So a big thanks to these folks and to everyone else that's been involved so far. So Caitlin, sorry, to, we, uh, we have 10 minutes for a delegation. So uh, we uh, encourage you to try and wrap things up here fairly soon. Great, yeah, I'm just on thanks. my last couple slides, thanks. So uh, these are the key works that will be happening in uh, the next couple months. Uh, we'll be regrading and recontouring the site, moving material off site, um, and continuing with all of the revegetation works on site. So the funds raised to date are about 84% uh, of the total project, which includes the purchase price um, and about 75% of the restoration costs, which is why I'm here today, of course. So one of the things that we are seeking from the CVRD today is both a direct financial give and in-kind support for the project. So the financial contribution, um, a sliding scale uh, would be anywhere from 15 to $20,000 annually would be appropriate. We're seeking funding for both this year and next year potentially. Um, in-kind contributions, uh, I would be it would be greatly appreciated if uh, the council here could support our work by contributing in kind to the project. So I'd imagine that these could look like a variety of things and I would welcome staff, CVRD staff input on what this could look like. Um, some thoughts from my perspective are the donation of topsoil, um, the support of tipping fee waiving where possible for the materials moving off the site. Um, as well as supporting the recycling of the wood waste that's coming off the site as well. 
So those are the three main areas I see right now for in-kind contribution, but like I said, I would welcome staff input on other areas where the CVRD and their facilities could support this work in by reducing cost and cost saving measures. Perfect. Thank you for your time today. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions you folks may have. Thank you, Robert. That's Sure. Thanks, Caitlin, for the presentation. And uh, I appreciate it that you showed us the historical pictures. When I moved to the valley in the late 90s, I remember the smell of yellow cedar as you cross the bridge. It was quite a different uh, different site and time, it feels like, and different, almost like a different town. We never noticed change from year to year, but over 20 years, oh boy. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so that was great. Um, and thanks for all your work. I know there's a, a number of champions for this project at the broader um, elected official table. I've talked to Doug Hillian a lot about it over the years. He's been a strong champion. And um, I know our Melly Runner Leonard as well as, has gone to bat for this project quite a bit in the past. So really great um, to see all the progress and the update. Um, in, in regards to your uh, your request, I, I think it, it'd be fine. We do have a lot of demand obviously in the rural areas, but this is, if you stay on for the next five hours, or at least for the next hour, we have two items that are directly related to this. One is our uh, project around the dark road is gonna be on the agenda and trying to assemble a partnership. I know Project Watershed's part of it, or at least it's being copied on the correspondence. And uh, <laughs> and then the other one is, um, um, is, um, What's the second one? Oh, the Courtney Flat Service, where we we look after the uh, the levy that controls the uh, the water into uh, the farming fields. Mm -hmm. So a lot of interconnected things with uh, the area. So I'd be happy to look at a, a contribution for the next couple of years, as you see. And in terms of the topsoil, uh, to our CAO, would it be appropriate if one of us, or on behalf of you know maybe our chair, could bring to uh, the waste management uh, a request to look at the skyrocket product we have we make a lot of um, it's not quite topsoil but it's um, amazingly rich awesome <laughs> organic material and i know it gets used for landscaping purposes so if we're already not donating that perhaps we could have an ask to the board for a donation to the project so um yeah quite positive and thanks for coming great thank you so much for having me director b Thank you, Mr. Chair and through CAO. Um, this is obviously a, a tremendous success story for Project Watershed. I know that they've been talking about it for quite a long time, I guess, ever since the uh, mill shut down. Um, being uh, one of the fossils around the table here, I can remember uh, in the 50s driving along the dike and the bee, the beehive burners that were going full time at the mill were there was so much ash and smoke coming out of them that you it was basically driving through fog all along the dike road. <laughs> you had to have your lights on and watch the taillights of the car in front of you, other but you might just drive off into the estuary. So it's come a long, long way. The world has changed, as Director Arbor said, changed quite a lot, and it's changing even more. Uh, I guess uh, I don't have any real questions. I, I think we can support uh, with some in-kind possibly, and certainly with the um, waste management service, we can uh, see if we can do uh, some waiving of fees at the uh, at the landfill. I think uh, Director Arbor mentioned uh, the fact we, we may be able to use some of the wood waste, as long as it's not yellow cedar. <laughs> So anyway, thank you so much for uh, for presenting and, uh, you know, congratulations all around. I'm looking forward to a, a tremendous uh, opening ceremony and uh, the prime minister flying in on his own private helicopter to cut the ribbon. Perfect. Thank you so much for your support and thank you for your time today. Thanks, Kaylon. So moving to a second delegation. Oh, sorry. Phone on receipt of the... Go ahead, Director Robert. So just to ask you, do you think it would be appropriate to bring this to waste management um, coming from this table? 
Uh, my suggestion to the directors would be uh, in, under new business, adopt a resolution to direct staff to come back with a report. We'll work with Caitlin to specify exactly the amounts and the quality of soil that they're looking for, as well as uh, the materials that might go to the waste management site. Then you as directors can uh, take those, that request and those specifics to, to the Solid Waste Board. Great, so we'll move it in a second. Second delegation. Thanks. Second. Great, thank you. Light. I'm sorry, who are we lighten up again? It's on my agenda here somewhere. Yep, we've come along with all the arts. It's Jennifer Casey and uh, Juliana Bedoa. Great. Yeah. Thanks. And just a reminder again, we got 10 minutes for a delegation. Cheers. I do have a loud voice. I used to be a teacher, so. Um, <laughs> thank you guys for hearing us today. We um, are Comox Valley Arts. We're here for two reasons. Uh, to give you an organizational update on our, is it top or to the side? Okay. Uh, on our organization, an update as well as, well, originally we were gonna be making a request for 5,000 additional funds. But over the weekend, since we sent our slides to Antoinette, we found out that we are in fact slated for a total of 9,200. So this presentation is more of a thank you, um, as well as a very minor request for an adjustment to that request that was made in October to reflect some pilot programs we hope to uh, launch this summer. So uh, who are we? We're Comox Valley Arts. Our job is to bring more arts experiences to residents and visitors alike. Our organization is 55 years old. It is, in fact, one of the oldest nonprofits in the Valley. We went through an organizational transition back in the fall. So I am new to my position as executive director. Juliana is new to her position as community engagement director. We have a new board of directors and our programs are likewise changing. We have spent some time uh, since the fall looking at a, a slew of programs that have tried to be uh, something for everybody uh, with a very small capacity. And we are doing some programmatic streamlining. So we're gonna provide you with an update on our thinking there. Um, okay, so I think that's it for everything here. Juliana, I'm going to pass it off to you to just provide a little bit more fleshing out of the programs that we've offered and things that we've done to change and pivot uh, since starting. So take it away. Thank you, Jenny. So again, my name is Juliana Bedoya. I am the Community Engagement Director for CV Arts and in charge of program design. So we offer wide, as you know, we offer a wide variety of programs, including festivals, markets, and exhibitions. And as new staff, we have been restructuring our programs by assessing relevancy, evaluating impact, and growing our community partnerships. Um, in the slide that is up there, uh, you can see some of the programs that we have recently delivered uh, that show evidence of how as an arts organization we want to move past the role of entertainers and maximize the power of the arts as a vehicle to communicate for community care, for community reflection and social transformation. So first there is Family Day coming up this coming weekend, long weekend. Uh, we partnered with the city of Corny and we created uh, kits and a photo booth at the Lewis Center to creatively enhance and celebrate family connection. The YQQ, the mindful travel exhibit that we just um, have up at the airport right now, uh, it's an exhibition that has a huge reach across the Central Island region, and we're working hard from a curatorial front to showcase more diversity and to invite more reflection as we create our calls for submissions, as it was the case for Mindful Trouble. The 30-day drawing challenge, I don't know if any of you were part of that. It was a very successful program that we just wrapped up in January, and um, it has huge reach beyond the Central Island region, actually international too. Uh, we partnered with the city of uh, Courtney, the art gallery, uh, the regional libraries in our region, and uh, had tried to expand our community, uh, our in-person community engagement, and set up some drawing stations at the, their different facilities. And lastly, here the, at the corner, the bottom corner, the moonlight and magic uh, at the art gallery uh, plaza, 
Um, we partnered with the Downtown Courtney Business Improvement Association, and we created an event that showcased Quinish the glacier from an indigenous lens and invited community participation and reflection around climate change issues. So that's in a nutshell program related. I'll pass it on to Jenny. That's in a nutshell the programs we've done since October. Um, we are also involved in lots of uh, summer street markets, uh, festivals, events, opportunities for artists. Uh, that's just a small nutshell. And one thing I do want to pull out for this group is the Central Island Arts Guide and Studio Tour. So this is very much a regional program, as you can see from this map. It is a studio tour that showcases over 100 artists, over 180 kilometer long three day weekend experience. So this is a, you know, an area that is testimony to our regional work. We haven't done the studio tour or the organization hasn't in a number of years due to the pandemic. So we are just announced that we're going to do it again this year. So we're excited. We hope to have hundred artists again. Before we get too off in the weeds around the three pilot programs, I'm excited to share with you guys. I do want to talk about the aligned goals between the regional district and our organization. So community partnerships are at the heart of what we do, as you saw from Juliana's slide. We are very small staff, so we leverage our relationships and our connections to other organizations. We also advocate strongly on behalf of the arts and the economic power of the arts and the cultural sector. Uh, over half of those artists and studios that you saw in that last slide are from areas outside of the city of Courtney. Our membership base also reflects that. So we are very much a regional organization, even though we're based in the city of Courtney. So I don't want to spend too much time on this because I know we're very short, 10 minutes goes by fast, but um, we're streamlining our programs, we're thinking about meaning, we're thinking about relevancy, we're thinking about the question of what is an arts council in 2023, and we're aligning all of those questions around community needs. One uh, example is how we are internally thinking about our program structures. I won't go through this in too much detail, but I just wanted to note that like internally, we have the social impact of art front and center in how we're thinking about our work. We also are thinking about what are the community needs and aligning programs and streamlining around forward thinking goals. So uh, this framework is concise, it's forward looking and it's clear. And that's the internal organ organizational changes that we have made since uh, starting in our new positions. Okay, um, exciting time. So we wanna tell you about three pilots that are coming this summer. The first, I'm just gonna briefly touch on these, you guys, because again, time. Um, the Digital Creation Hub is providing accessibility to digital tools for art making, completely eliminating the cost barrier to these expensive digital tools for artists. Thinking about uh, expensive video gear, sound recording equipment, uh, a sound studio uh, provided at a very low cost or completely free to certain populations uh, that is unheard of within our region. So this will be luring people in. The second is Arts Plus Land. So this is a pilot program that we are teeing up for 2024 and we're gonna do a little teaser this summer with one or two artists. So thinking about place-based art experiences outdoors. Artists will come to install surprising works in the landscape outside of the white cube of the gallery. So think about what it would be like to walk through a forest and encounter like colorful art installations and how that would drive people to come visit farms in our, in our region or forests. So we are doing a, a test pilot this summer with one or two artists, and then we might expand on that and make it a greater showcasing. And we know this has the potential to lure in some really impressive artists from beyond just British Columbia. Um, okay. And this is probably what we're most excited this summer, maybe because like uh, the sight of a trailer really brings up like, oh, camping memories and the smell of like roasted marshmallows. But we're going to have something called the Arts Wagon this summer. We already have the trailer. We just need to brand it and partner with some artists. So the idea is quite literally taking arts and culture amenities to rural areas that do not have them, providing a whole slew of potential art making uh, opportunities like participatory art making, uh, storytelling, uh, audio equipment, all kinds of stuff to just bring the arts into areas that don't have those amenities. Uh, we know that there's a need for this. We've talked to other arts councils about partnering and other artists. So that's exciting. We, again, we already have the trailer. We just need it to be insured. <laughs> so, and we are going to wrap it in some branding and, and what have you. So 
um, probably out of time, right? Real close at the tail end. So uh, just providing a slight amount of context to this work, we aren't doing any of this stuff in a vacuum. Uh, there's a lot of work happening in the sector and nowhere near enough recognition for the power, the economic power of the arts and culture here. We know that uh, from previous slides that I think I maybe I didn't mention this, but there's a, a report has gone out by Creative Coast that has identified Vancouver Island as a regional power for arts and culture, like unlike anywhere else in the country the island. Uh, we know within Comox Valley that there are 5,000 creatives that live and work here. So this is an untapped resource. Within this uh, context, the city of Courtney is doing its cultural planning process right now. And there is a regional tourism plan in the works right now that I participated in a meeting last Friday. There are 45 different deliverables and the arts were mentioned twice. So you know, there is a need for us to be sitting at those table, tables to be able to push forward on, on the, in, encouraging people to see the economic value of the arts. So uh, I'm gonna end with uh, two things sort of forward looking. As we go through organizational streamlining and thinking about the answer to that question about what is the point of an art, arts council in 2023? What is our purpose? We are aligning with uh, identified needs in the area, including uh, within the city of Courtney's official city plan, the need for a regional art center. We're at the sort of early stage of that conversation, but we feel that we can help make that happen. And we want to plant that seed now and think about the opportunity, the incredible opportunity that we would have to create something really, really special here, given the context. For funding, again, this presentation is really more of a thank you and an organizational update, some things to expect from us in the coming months. Uh, we are heavily funded by the province and by the city of Courtney. Uh, we are working on increasing our earned revenue, particularly from our digital creation hub, uh, which will have a fee structure, uh, as well as from the arts guide that you guys saw earlier. So we do have earned revenue, but we are heavily grants focused um, and grant funded. Um, with a, a small, modest increase to that uh, slated 9,200, which is on the budget, again, thank you, uh, we would be able to really start launching those three pilot projects that we talked to you guys about earlier. So that's it for us. And thank you so much for the time. Uh, I guess we'll go sit down or stay up here. Questions? Oh. Okay. Yeah, if you don't mind staying there, I'm sure, I'm sure there'll probably be a couple of questions, Director Arbor. Thanks, Chair. Um, thank you for coming over. And uh, I come from the nonprofit sector. Usually you, you get a staff turnover or a board turnover, and sometimes you get both. And uh, always an exciting time when that happens. So um, I, I, I can't imagine uh, the amount of work that has to go into uh, you know refreshing the organization and setting a new course. So thank you for all your work on that. Um, yeah, it's uh, well, you shouldn't say thank you about the money because it's actually up for debate today uh, so we haven't passed the budget oh. yet the 9200 but you, you did do a really good job with your presentation uh, so it's always good to see people uh, come and present to us and I think you build a good case um, you, if you haven't connected with, uh, with them yet I, I, you have two really great six sister organizations and Hornby and Denman uh, two communities I represent and I'm sure you'll get a chance to connect with them later and in my area I look after the communities from Royston to down to Fannie Bay and uh, in regards to the uh, outdoor um, kind of project that you're piloting, um, I, I'd be quite keen to build some connections in Royston or Union Bay. There's different societies and people I know that could be interested in the future. It doesn't have to be now, but just planting my own seed to the seeds you planted. And um, yeah, thank you. We'll, um, we'll have, um, I think in about an hour or so, we'll, we'll be considering the budget for all of our arts contributions. So thank you for coming and presenting. Wonderful. Edwin. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for that presentation. That was great. Um, my question, I guess, is uh, around uh, new and budding youth artists, uh, School District 71, working with them. Um, you know, we got uh, young, young artists in drama, music, um, and 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 visual arts, uh, but you know we've seen a steady erosion of of uh, of music programs in in the school system. And when you think back, I mean, we've got uh, 
we've got some reason to crow about our our, our young people. I think uh, Sarah Newfeld from Black Creek was uh, an integral part of Arcade Fire that won, I think, four Grammy Awards. Uh, that's Grammys, not Junos. You know, not to mention that our Juno Award winners that live here. Um, of course, Kim Cottrell from Lazo, uh, Pamela Anderson, Barry Pepper. I think his, his parents lived on, on Demon for a while. Actually, Kim's mom just passed away, I think, just, just recently. But, you know, we had a string program. They let it go. Uh, you look at Powell River, which I think is, is a powerhouse of arts. And because they kept it alive. So I, I do think that, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, supporting supporting artists in, in the later stages of their <laughs> career, um, I think it's really integral that we put our money in, in with, the, with the young ones and, 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 and foster it as much as possible. Uh, the other thing was you talk about, you know, performance, uh, exhibitions, festivals, music concerts, et cetera. Um, there is a, uh, you may be aware of a long-standing drive to try to get a, a multi, a multiplex building of large size that could actually host some of the bigger concerts and whatever. And we're still trying to get that on, on the radar, but, uh, you know, I think it would be great to have the art societies, uh, support that because when we actually looked into it originally, we had a lot of support from the art societies and the Sid Williams Theater, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, the only other thing, I guess, was, um, you know, art in public places and, and the informal uh, music, which I, I've been part of all my life, uh, playing in, in bands and whatever since, uh, well, probably starting at 13. <laughs> but, um, you know, even that's dried right up. There's, there's, no, there's no outside of maybe uh, uh, the Roystown pub a little bit, you know, a little bit at the... At the um, at the uh, uh, whistle stop. At one time, we had a real vibrant, I mean, Cumberland's still going, obviously, the, the Waverly's still going, but we used to have a, a real vi vibrant, um, informal uh, arts uh, and, and music uh, uh, community that, that sustained people under the radar, you know, which came as a big surprise when they tried to collect the Serb. You probably heard the story about, you know, the musician who phoned up, uh, Ottawa, I tried to get a hold of somebody for about half an hour, finally got through. And the nice young lady said, well, yeah, musicians, yeah, I think we've got something here. Look down the list, there it is. You guys get two free drink tickets. Yeah, thanks. The story of the arts. Am I able to respond at all? Please. I just wanted to say thank you for bringing up so many incredible things that I am personally deeply passionate about. From like the beginning, um, your uh, support for emerging or budding artists. I am a former art teacher. I worked in the schools and I, those are my people. Um, one way that we can start to kind of support that group is through a micro grant program. We have had um, a somewhat arbitrary process of distributing funds to artists for various methods. So, probably really awesome things, but it isn't been an equitable process. So putting a masthead on that of micro grant program, everybody can apply. And it's a, 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 you know, you get a fair shot and really focusing on emerging artists, because I agree with you, there is a lot of support and a lot of resources and infrastructure for established artists. Uh, maybe people that are a little bit older than, you know, in their 20s or 30s and cannot afford a house to house a studio. So we do want to think heavily about that population and try to pivot a lot of our work to support and showcase and champion that. Um, you brought up so many good points. I wish I had a pen to write them down. Um, from an audio recording from creating space for those emerging musicians, um, the Digital Creation Hub is a recording studio, a community recording studio. You can come in and you can work with a coach and you can have a, like a, a track recorded with a coach there for your own band, but regardless of, you know, your level of professionalism, well, professionalism isn't the right word, you know, where you're, you're uh, how, how skilled you are. Yeah. So we're, we're trying to, in, again, we're new to our positions. We are thinking a lot about that younger, less established voice, regardless of your media of practice. Thank you for your questions. They're really great. I did have one more question. Can we, Go back to this slide with regards to the various contributions that have been made. Sure, and this is I should specify my yeah. Um, 
That is according to our most recent um, audit, but not audited, but our review engagement. I'm just curious, maybe it's a question I can ask uh, Russell in regards to the Coatex Valley Regional District. Uh, I know we do have our cultural and arts uh, service. Is Are there do dollars that are directed uh, towards the art, arts and culture uh, industry here in the Comox Valley? Yes, yeah, so that's the um, the budget that we'll be considering later on in the agenda. And the $5,200 is what was previewed from last year with correct. a 92 budgeted this year and your ask of 10, correct? For this yes, 10200 yep. yep, so that's that's the uh, monies that come from the rural areas, the three electoral areas that go directly to, to the arts. I, I guess the... The question, just having a quick look at uh, what the service provided to various organizations with regards to arts and culture in 2022 was in excess of $110,000. And I'm just kind of curious as to why uh, maybe that wasn't made mention of here in your presentation. Um, that's probably for all of the arts and culture organizations. So one thing is we're, we're not a bricks and mortar institution. We have an office space, but we're not like the gallery that can invite people in, which is a benefit to us in this current stage where we're at, because we can quite literally bring arts and culture outside of the city of Courtney to people. Um, I don't know what the breakdown is in that total amount there. Uh, I do know that we've received 5,200 for a number of years, and I understand the process from you know, speaking to a number of our board members, including Erzina, who's helped me understand the process. <laughs> but I'm not sure um, where that distribution is total. I know that we have our cultural anchors, the gallery, the Sid Williams, the museum. Um, at, they are larger organizations, and maybe they have a larger contribution that comes out of that. Yeah, and, and Mr. Chair, the uh, the total for last year was 109 plus, and uh, Doug DeMarzo will be reviewing the budget with you and answering any questions and, because there's a chart there on page three of that report that outlines where the monies went to for the other organizations as well. Great, thanks. Any other questions? No. Motion to receive. Sorry, we received. Except. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. So moving into the next agenda item is the management report. So we want a motion. Second. Thank you. And no questions for the report and what we did receive. I, I thought we had received. So, okay, motion receive. Report, management report. Okay. Okay. Now we're voting on. Okay. Received financial plan. Second. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chair and Directors, and uh, we are moving forward on the financial plan with additional reports coming forward to the electoral areas today. I uh, just uh, refer to Jake Martins, have we received any correspondence to date? Just one item which is on the agenda? Yes, and is included in the agenda here. And uh, that's it for these the, the electoral area services at this time. I think Director Arbor may have a question. Yeah, thanks. And, and I think it's fair to say that uh, somehow in our financial uh, process to receive public input, I can tell you that, you know, this is our first item of correspondence and we get very little formal correspondence into our financial planning process. I think it's fair to say that 99% of the comments we get is informal <laughs> through conversations we have with constituents or people uh, that may be uh, directly tied with the services. So we have our first correspondence here, which talks about the reserves and uh, that the regional district holds and um, and a concern that um, we have close to $500 million in uh, reserve accounts. First of all, um, I, I would like staff to clarify whether the amount is correct uh, so that the person who wrote in may get better information uh, about what the total sum of our reserve is. And second, I'd like to assure that um, the reserves really help smoothen out um, costs over time. It's just like a house, you know, if if you're going to build a roof that's costing you 40 grand in two years, rather than to requisition 40 grand in two years, 
from now, you know, over three years, we in 15. So it really helps smoothen out taxes over time. And that's the main function for a lot of it for reserves. But I'd love staff to comment whether we hold $500 million in the reserves currently. And Mr. Chair, I'll just uh, refer that question to uh, Kevin DeVell. Put him on the spot. He's been waiting all day. Yeah. Thank you very much through the chair to the directors. So yes, I can I can certainly attempt to respond to this. So um, yeah, if you look at our 2021 year in financial statements, it, it does indicate, um, and I believe what the, what the uh, submitter was looking at was our accumulated surplus amount. Uh, so if you look at our 2021 financial statements, it indicates about $277 million in accumulated surplus. However, you have to understand that a significant part of that, in fact, the majority of that is changes in the equity to our tangible capital assets. So those are fixed assets and those will um, increase or decrease from year to year in value. So a lion's share of that is that. Uh, Director Arbor also did indicate that, you know, there are a number of reserves that are also included in that balance. And um, you know, with respect to you know good financial uh, practice, and and certainly looking forward to financial uh, sustainability of our services, both from a operational program and a, and a capital sense, it's always good to you know maintain good healthy reserves within you know uh, advisable parameters to ensure that we can look at funding our our capital projects um, you know year over year. Certainly, as Director Arbor mentioned, also looking at that kind of stabilization of requisition and 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 those. Kinds kinds of things. It's also important to remember that as a regional district, um, you know, we do have to maintain uh, reserves for each, well, not every service, but certainly the lion's share of the services that we deliver. And the reserves that, you know, are within each of those services must stay within each of those services. So it's not like we can share between those reserves. It's just the way regional district services are structured. So, you know, really, we look at each of those reserves independently and, and you know, based on financial analysis, look at what we feel we need to maintain in each of those reserves. Yeah, what he said. Um, I think it's not well understood um, by a lot of people. I think in, including a, a former CAO of the city of Courtney that, that actually was a CAO of a regional district at one time, had to be reminded the fact that we have to have these reserves in every service. So I don't know what is our reserves with the solid waste. I think it's it's millions of dollars we have to have just in case there's an issue up there because nobody's going to insure it for us. So we have to be self self insuring. But a lot of people we find um, you know at least lately I found <clears throat> in the electoral areas have recently moved here. Uh, from elsewhere and uh, mostly from municipalities that, that have different powers, different structures than, than electoral areas. So uh, I call it the lower mainlandization of the Comox Valley. Thank you. Any other questions? Do we need to go to a vote? Gentlemen? Carrie? Next item. Second. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair and Directors. And Brian Chow is here to present this report and answer any questions you may have. Hey, Tom. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, through the CEO to the committee and the, ch uh, the chairman of the committee, uh, we have a rezoning application. The subject property is located at 1334 and 1338 Hassan Road and is approximately 1.35 hectares in size. The applicant proposes to rezone the subject property to use Section 514 of the Local Government Act which is subdivision to provide residence for a relative. The sizes of the proposed lot A and remainder lots are 0 0.345 hectares and one hectare respectively. On October 26, 2021, 
the CVID board endorsed the agency referral list and First Nations referrals. Comments received are listed in Appendix B of the staff report. Um, of those comments received from First Nations uh, and from Advisory Planning Commission for Area B and from Allen Health, they were all in support of the rezoning with no concerns or comments. Staff, as such, staff has prepared a draft bylaw to amend the zoning bylaw, which is in Appendix A, that would enable a two lot subdivision pursuant to Section 514 of the Local Government Act, but limit the density to one single detached dwelling per lot in order to maintain the overall density within the underlying zone. Staff is recommending that this proposed bylaw be given first and second reading and that a public hearing be scheduled based on the reasons, reasons listed in the staff report, some of which included that Section 514 subdivisions, when able to meet density and servicing requirements, help residents age in place and support succession planning. While the subject property is in close proximity to the town of Comox, this proposal will have negligible impacts on the land use pattern as standard is maintained and infrastructure impacts is likely to be uh, minimal or slight. Uh, when I say infrastructure impact, I meant traffic and water consumption. The applicants, uh, Don and Sean McQueen, are in attendance to answer any questions you may have. And Mr. Chair. Thanks, Adam. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, three chairs and uh, CAO to staff. You know, thank heavens we have the, uh, the provincial 514. Um, because the regional growth strategy for the electoral areas has turned into the regional no growth strategy in order to uh, take a property and and uh, and create uh, a space for a family member to get started in this world, which is extremely expensive to begin with, you pretty well have to start off with 18 hectares of land. And that doesn't really make a lot of sense in some of the areas that are basically a stone's throw away from municipalities. But um, whether or not there'll be any uh, any appetite by our municipal partners to review that section um, is uh, beyond me. But uh, at least this way, I think you hit all, hit on all the, all the big points, and that's the fact that it's increasingly difficult for the younger generation to get to get a foothold in the property market. Um, we have people that are aging in place on their properties that uh, could certainly benefit from from having uh, their son or daughter um, living on the property so they somebody else can get up and shovel the roof or or, or whatever or pick the apples. So I mean this is this is the only way out I think right now we got ourselves ham hamstrung with the nine hectare or nine acre minimum or hectare minimum. So um, it, this, this is, I think, is being used more and more, and it's not a bad thing. It's actually a, a way out for the, some of the residents. As I say, not so much the ones that are way the heck out in the country, but the ones that live in that interface area where you basically are sitting on more or less a municipal sized lot. There's no increase in density. That was a good point to make. So there really is no increase because we're already allowed to build a secondary dwelling. But this allows the transfer of title, which gives uh, the next generation a leg up with the bank. So um, I'm certainly in, in favor of this uh, and any other 514 that comes before us. Thank you. Thank you, Director Edwin. Danielle? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Yeah, and I, I agree with Director Grieve. I'm quite happy to move this to public hearing if the if acknowledging is the chair's area and area B. So uh, looking forward if he has comments. But otherwise, I'm I'm good to go on this. And um, the only thing I would say is I, I would not say that our regional growth strategy is uh, is a no growth and uh, impediment to the rural areas. I think our regional growth strategy in the Comox Valley is working quite well. Uh, people can have secondary dwelling, carriage homes, and make applications for subdivisions such as this one. So I think um, same uh, same opinion in the end, but a different rationale. And I think uh, I'm in favor as well of moving this forward to public hearing. Thank you. 
Great. So motion to accept the report. Thanks. Any recommendation? Second. Carried. Mm -hmm. Oh. Carried. All right. Moving on to the next item. Thank you. Thank you, Chair and Directors. And Dylan Thiessen is here to present this report and answer any of the questions the directors may have. Thank you very much. Uh, through the chair to the directors, this may sound a little repetitive, but uh, staff sent referrals to several First Nations and external agencies for application RZ1C21 to rezone property at 3745 Piercy Road and received responses from Hamalco First Nation, Wewaikum, the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure, and Vancouver Island Health Authority. No objections were raised to the proposed application. The applicant is seeking to rezone their rural eight zoned property to enable a subdivision under Section 514, as well of the Local Government Act, which again outlines criteria for subdivision, specifically to provide a residence for a relative. Bylaw number 741, being the Rural Comox Valley Zoning Bylaw number 520, Amendment number 12, will rezone the property from Rural 8 to Rural 8, Exception 13. And this will reduce the minimum lot area for subdivision from eight hectares to 1.4 hectares. And this lower minimum parcel size will only apply to subdivisions created under section 14, 514 rather of the Local Government Act. And the new zones density will again be limited to one dwelling per property, which will retain the overall density despite the subdivision. For, for these reasons, as well as others outlined in the staff report, staff are recommending that the board give first and second reading to bylaw number 741 and schedule a public hearing as required by section 464, subsection one of the Local Government Act. The applicant was not able to make this meeting, but staff are happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions? Edwin? Just once again to repeat, I think that uh, the 514 um, option that is a provincial statute uh, is certainly uh, the only thing that that really can help people in the uh, in the uh, rural areas. I'm thinking that this is uh, supportable, and uh, because it is a residence for a relative, and as I mentioned before, it's it's very important. Uh, if you're going to Asian place to have family around. Thank you. Motion to accept the report. <clears throat> Carrie? Move we'll recommendation. Oh. Carrie? Thank you. We'll have then coming up with the issue back to second day. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors, and Robin Holm is here to present this report and answer your questions. Sorry, Russell, I'll actually be me again. Thank you. Um, through the Chair to the Directors, staff are working on a collaborative initiative to incorporate a Green Shores approach at Dyke Road Park, which will restore sensitive ecosystems and increase coastal resilience by responding to sea level rise and erosion. Partners involved in this project include Comox First Nations Guardians, the Stewardship Center of BC, Project Watershed, the Pacific Salmon Foundation, and the Guardians of Mid-Island Estuaries, with technical support provided by coastal engineers and landscape architects. The project work is supported by the work that was done through the first two phases of the Coastal Flood Adaptation Strategy, which highlighted the Comox Road area as being at high risk of coastal flooding. And the design has made an effort to tie in with restoration works at Couscous Sum, which you heard earlier today. However, the project scope has increased to include the establishment of a tidal channel and remove invasive species in the north section of the park. With this increase in scope, as well as the escalation of construction costs, the project's estimated budget has also increased and staff are seeking alternative funding sources to cost share the project's implementation. Staff are seeking board support to apply to UPCM's Community, Community Emergency Preparedness Fund through its Disaster Risk Reduction Climate Adaptation Grant. 
The project is eligible under UPCM's Category 3 Small Scale Structural Activities designation. Staff are happy to answer any questions you might have on the project. Any questions? Edwin? Um, just just one through uh, the the chair and the CEO to staff. Um, there was mention about the viewing platform decaying. Well, I've been there recently, and it doesn't show any major signs of decay. Is who who is actually driving this project, and is the Rotary Club involved in any way, shape, or form? Through the CAO to Director Grave, I'll try my best to answer those questions. Mark Harrison was going to be here, but he's unable to make it here. Um, the Rotary, we have been, um, through parks, we have been, uh, I guess, informing them of the process, and we plan to engage them with uh, essentially the redevelopment of the gazebo and the platform. They're going to be involved in that process. Um, so Mark has been working that um that relationship and that and that engagement process. Uh, in terms of the failing concrete structure, it, it's been confirmed by a geotech engineer that it is failing and that it's um in terms of life, life cycle, it's it's due to be repaired or replaced. And so that is why this opportunity presented itself. It's um in the parks work plan this year to be redeveloped. And so when the opportunity to work with the Stewardship Center for BC on this initiative, it seemed like an opportunity to work together to approach the site more comprehensively and as well to address some of the uh, findings that came out of the coastal flood adaptation strategy. And uh, Mr. Chair, Robin did an excellent job of answering the question, but just to let you know that Mark Harrison and Mark Hart are both on the line if there are additional questions specific to, to parks and their initiative. Well, excuse me, but didn't we just throw a bunch of money at this not too long ago? When was the last time we, we upgraded that that viewing platform? And I know, I know I, I'm not going to be popular, but when you start throwing a million dollars around all the time, um, you know, I think that we're in the middle of budget process. But uh, I I think that if something's, you know, personally speaking, I it's, it, it's, there's nice to haves and there's need to haves. This looks to me like a, a little over the top nice to have at this point in time. But um, I'll leave it to the board to decide what they want to do. And Mr. Chair, if I could just ask Robin to confirm where the source of funding is coming from yeah. with respect to local taxpayers versus what's coming from grants. And then after that, Mark, if you could speak to the past in terms of the maintenance and upgrades of the of the structure to answer Director Grieve's question. Thank you, Russell. I'll do my best um, uh, through the CEO to Director uh, Grieve. We have been doing this entire project through grant funding. The seed funding came through the Pacific Salmon Foundation, and that was through this this partnership with the Stewardship Center and uh, Project Watershed. And so that has all been uh, grant funded. And then of course, in-kind contribution from the CVRD. At this point, um, now that we have pro uh, projected project costs, we are all seeking funding. All of the partners are doing their very best to seek funding through uh, grant programs. Uh, Project Water Watershed, who was here earlier, they're seeking funding through a Canadian uh, federal grant program that specifically would be looking at the restoration works. And in order to tackle the I would call it the hardscaping, the, the actual demolition costs, all of that works, that's essentially what we're looking to cover through this grant program. And that's to address uh, coastal mitigation, coastal adaptation. And, and that's because this site has been identified as being a uh, high risk for overtopping coastal flooding during uh, winter storms. And so the intent of this project would be to raise the site to the 2100 FCL. And that, and that would be done through primarily this large source of grant funding. So we're just in the uh, in the process of finalizing those eligible costs, but we're hoping to apply up to a million dollars. And so if successful in that, we would not need to include any tax dollars in this project. Mark, were you going to add anything else to the question or comments? Mark Hart? Sorry, Mark Harrison? Yeah. Guessing not. 
correct, Robert? Yeah, thanks. And I'll I'll, uh, I'll take it just one level up in terms of the relevance of this project when we um, completed our climate change coastal flood adaptation strategy. We did note that this area around Comox Bay was one of the, our most at risk um, from um, increased tidal impacts and sea level rise. And uh, when it, when we think about the, uh, as we do all these activities, including Kuskusum earlier, as we restore natural flow, realizing um, IR1 is right there uh, and the fields, um, and, and one that we didn't mention yet is really the dike road itself, right? The economic value of that road and that connectivity is being a main artery to the town of Comox, to Comox First Nation. I think any effort that we focus in that area in collaboration with Comox First Nation, the Guardians, uh, the city of Courtney, that's a fantastic project. Uh, and the fact that, as staff says, we're not requisiting money for it yet <laughs> is great news. I would also highlight that in December, at the beginning of December, uh, the federal government issued an, a new, uh, which is just the start of it, but a new $1.6 billion for projects such as this, of which the FCM through the Green Municipal Fund will receive an envelope of about $525 million. So if we want to apply for further funding, in addition to the CPF, I think we should look at that. Um, I think that million bucks is just going to get the, sh the show going, but as we as we look at that whole connectivity from Kuskusam all the way down towards uh, the First Nation uh, community, um, this is great. This is paddling in, in the right direction, in my opinion, and, and it's going to be a spectacular project if, if we end up with a park that connects all that or uh, some kind of, of way for people um, to, um, to have uh, some access. Director Green. Well, of course, I will demur to the electoral area rep from Area B, as well as uh, Comox First Nation on this one. But um, yeah, um, I think this will be a great experiment uh, added to the Green Shores initiative on the next page as well. We're going to see what actually works and what actually does not work. Thank you. Just to... Uh, if I could, a question to the CEO in regards to the Comox First Nation and their particular support for this particular project. Has there been confirmation? Robin, can you speak to the engagement we've had with Comox? Sorry, um, I can't thank you, Russell. Uh, staff presented at Chief and Council I want to say back in March of last year, and there we received some very um, good feedback on additional elements to consider uh, the tidal channel, the the um, establishment of the tidal channel for the purpose of salmon habitat restoration was an important one, and that's why it has been uh, it has been included. And uh, when we got to budget constraints, it was an important element that did not get dropped just because this is such an important piece to the Comox Guardians, as well as the work that's being done with the Mid-Island uh, Guardians of the Estuaries. Thanks. Any other questions, comments? So motion to accept the report. Carried. So receive the recommendation. Carried. So we received the recommendation. Do we need to vote on the recommendation as well? We did? Okay. Thanks. Just clarifying things there. So there was a receipt and then there was a accept the recommendation. Perfect. Number four. Thank you. Thank you, Chair and Directors. And Jennifer Steele is here. Uh, this is in response to some feedback we received from you at the last EA meeting with respect to um, engagement. And uh, Jennifer will present the report and answer your questions. Jennifer? 
to the chair, to the directors, thank you for having me back here again. On January 30th, we provided two options for moving forward with electoral area engagement. You'll notice in the staff report that there are two new options that I'll quickly kind of go through that are reduced costs. Option A, the approximate cost of about $45,000. This option will be doing two combined newsletters, so it'll cover all your topic areas. It'll be printed and it'll do a bulk mail drop to all electoral area residents. We'll continue to have your EA engagement page on Connect CVRD. We won't do any Zoom webinar events and we'll promote both your open house and the Connect CVRD page. And you'll have one combined in-person event, most likely at the Civic Room, which you have optional attendance to come to. The second option is approximately $30,000. You'll have two virtual newsletters, which will be sent out through the Connect CVRD portal. You'll have the Connect CVRD page, no Zoom webinar events, a promotion of the Connect CVRD page, newsletters, and combined open houses. So a little bit more marketing dollars on this one, just to be able to get people to sign up and register for the Connect CVRD page. And you'll have one combined open house here at the Civic Room. I look forward to any questions. Correct, Harbor? Yeah, thanks, Chair. And thanks to staff for bringing back an option that's almost 25% of the <laughs> initial cost. I didn't expect that much. Uh, and while maintaining actually some really good offerings for uh, some shared co co uh, communication rather than individual communication. To, and I think that's, I like that. Um, I still, I know during um, the last couple of years, we did the card that we sent to every mailbox and that encourages people to uh, go. But I'm wondering if staff have stats on how many people went and downloaded the uh, PDF through there, because I'm tempted to recommend that we go back to the, the paper newsletter. It's something that people get and can read right away. Uh, but I, prior to that, I'd like to know if if the stats are super impressive on the on the number of people, if, if we've had hundreds and thousands of people opening it up on our website, then that might change my mind. Otherwise, I'd recommend option A. The stats are not super impressive, unfortunately. When you put in an extra barrier of go online to read it, uh, unfortunately, it's not being delivered right in your inbox or your mailbox. So I think both these two options provide a better opportunity for your information to get read. Thank you, Green. You good? Well, it's the same old story. Um, you uh, you ask a resident you know, about something, or you ask you about something, and you say, "Well, it uh, it was in the paper." And they go, "I don't read that damn paper." Oh, well, it was uh, on our website. I don't, I don't go look at your website. Oh, okay, but we did a mail out. I throw that stuff away. So, you know, it's it's a tough job, right, to try to break through. I think this is this is a good combination. It's got a bit of old school and a bit of new stuff and an in-person. So, I mean, that's pretty well rounds it out. So I'm in favor. Thanks. <clears throat> so uh, in regards to acceptance of the report, we're good. Carrie? For recommendations. Uh, second, we have any. Option A, sorry. Yeah. So we've received option A. Oh, carried. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks so much. Oh, I guess we're going to take a five minute help break. I don't want to go to sleep. Oh, nobody sleeps. We'll go to the cigar room. So they don't.
Lucy's here. We can start. No worries. All right. Can we get a motion to receive the financial planning items from Kevin? Second. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And Kevin Duvall will uh, tell you where we're at in the financial planning process for the EA services and lead us into a number of presentations. Thank you very much, Russell, through the Chair of the Directors. Good morning. So yes, um, we're you know, well into our annual financial planning process. So the dashboard is in front of you there. And again, once again, apologize for the small writing, but it's really the color, color coding that's uh, the visual here. And so as you can see, uh, between our meeting today and our subsequent meetings tomorrow, uh, we have a number of budgets going forward. For the Electoral Area Services Committee, we have 14 budget reports coming forward for your consideration today. And then we do have a subsequent eight uh, budget reports coming forward for your consideration on February 27th. Um, so yeah, we're, 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 we're kind of winding our ways through that process. Um, and I'll be speaking to the next budget here momentarily and, uh, yeah, certainly leave it there and I certainly welcome any questions. Any questions, Jim, John? All right, moving into, uh, Oh, sorry, vote on receipt of uh, plan millions. We'll receive the electoral area as a, electoral area as a finisher. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, Kevin will introduce this budget. All right, just waiting for Lisa to put the presentation up. Thank you. So yes, I have a brief presentation here on the electoral areas administration and election services um, service, function 130, and then certainly welcome any questions. And James Warren, our deputy CAO, is also here to provide support if needed. So uh, as we note here, um, you know, this particular service is really that service that supports our electoral area directors or members of the regional district. This is also where the board remuneration and board expenses are budgeted for our electoral area directors. Uh, and you can see that in the uh, in, uh, upcoming slide here as to the breakdown of that. This is also where we direct charge um, a number of salaries and benefits, uh, particularly for our, our CAO and also for the executive assistant. So 60% of those wages are allocated here. Uh, another 30% of those are allocated to our member municipalities administration service that will be presented to the board tomorrow. And then 10% is also uh, allocated out to our uh, Comox Strathcona Waste Management Service. Uh, there's a number of other staff positions that are allocated to the service as well, and they're indicated on the slide there. Our deputy CAO, a portion of his salary is uh, allocated here, along with our general manager of corporate services, our manager of legislative services, and then new this year is the senior manager of strategic initiatives. Uh, that is a 40% allocation to that service. And just as a reminder, this position uh, provides leadership on key projects and program delivery that have substantive impacts and benefits with uh, public organizations, Indigenous peoples, senior government, and municipal partners. Uh, this position is also allocated uh, partly to our member municipality administration of, at a tune of about 40%, and then is also partly allocated to our Comox Strathcona Regional Hospital District. Sorry about that. So this is just an overview of the year-over-year -year change in this particular budget and show the, so the comparative figures. Uh, changes from the 2022 budget include a tax requisition increase for 2022 of $131,000. That is partly uh, attributed to the uh, increases in the personnel and director remuneration costs. So as outlined, their personnel costs are up to, uh, just about 103,000 with directors remuneration costs uh, up about 10. Uh, as I just noted, with respect to the personnel costs, part of that increase is attributable to the new allocation of the uh, senior manager of strategic initiatives. It is also a result of uh, increases in, in our QP uh, labor rates and certainly also um, uh, allocations for our executive management uh, review process. Uh, director's remuneration is also up slightly and that includes the recent uh, increases uh, in director remuneration and also the inclusion of the benefits uh, that were brought forward and approved by the board last fall. 
Operational costs here are increasing by $4,600 from 2022, and those are largely due to costs associated with a small increase in constituency expense uh, and increases to EA community engagement costs. Uh, in regards to the former, um, you know, we always tend to budget a little bit extra in our constituency expenses coming out of an election cycle, uh, particularly if we do have new directors and we need to allocate some additional dollars to help support setting up a constituency offices. Um, as the previous report also noted, um, you know, if, uh, you know, with the uh, change in the uh, electoral area engagement process, we can certainly reflect the director's um, uh, requests in the recommended financial plan and make that change. Currently, in this particular budget, we have $95,000 annually allocated to uh, EA engagement. So, as I said, we'll take away that uh, um, previous report's uh, recommendation and incorporate that into the subsequent version of the budget. Within respect to here, we also do allocate election services costs, and the election costs are down forty-seven thousand dollars from twenty twenty-two. Um, obviously, that's a reflection of you know coming out of the election process. However, we will be increasing those once again as we move into twenty twenty-six uh, in, in setting the stage for that election cycle. And the overall proposed budget increase of $42,000 from 2022 represents about a 3.5% increase uh, year over year. And just a reminder, prior year surplus carry forwards have yet to be finalized. And so this is just a quick snapshot of the requisition shift between our 2022 adopted budget and where we're at currently with the 2023 proposed budget. So for each of the electoral areas, this would be the, the year over year change that makes up that $131,000. And I will leave it there and certainly welcome any questions. Rick Carver. Thanks for the presentation on this. And uh, I want to say after the last four years, how much I appreciate uh, the staff that's allocated to the electoral areas. Um, if I look last term without that capacity, things like the internet project would have never had a chance uh, for Hornby and Denman. And I think that uh, we have a very responsive staff to emerging issues in rural areas. I think the area I see it was mosquitoes last term. Uh, and, and you know, I, I just want to show appreciation. Um, the last week I, I was reflecting a little bit on, um, on our role as elected officials and uh, in the rural areas and partly because for the last four years I've been you know as soon as you take on this work which many of us uh, take quite seriously almost not quite full-time but differently last term I, I did it full-time uh, but you also think about uh, career transition as soon as you get elected because <laughs> it's just the level of remuneration is so small but then I was thinking about it and I um I realized that maybe we should review director's wages in in a different lens so what I did the last week is I start, started cal calculating the per population uh, cost of uh, the wage of elected officials. And so I added the remuneration of all the Courtney councillors, um, both uh, in terms of their role at Courtney and the mayor, and added there for those who participate, those who also participate in the regional district um, services, and uh, and then I divided it by their population, twenty five thousand. Then I created a ratio for us, which is about seven or eight thousand population. According to those ratios, we would be earning each something like one hundred twenty thousand dollars a year as electoral area director. No, I, I and and the reason why I say this is because the level of responsibility. The mayor of Courtney is now making eighty thousand a year, and he's supported by six councillors. I did the same for Cumberland. I think it came up uh, similar. They get paid pretty badly in Cumberland. I think it's 15,000, but even then uh, it was coming up that we would make about 95,000. So I think we're, we're, think, we're thinking uh, we need a different lens uh, for the level of responsibilities in, in the rural uh, areas. And, um, and, and why not do it by population? The other thing I would say is the director, uh, the municipal directors make 20 grand coming out to the board, right? We have, we share in all those services, right? So we, our work there is, is the same load. So basically 20,000 or whatever to get paid out of that wage is our presence on all these other boards, which means that for our electoral area, we make about 15,000, right? That's what we're getting paid to, to look after our varied areas and 8,000 people each. Um, I think something like, and, and, and the reason what made me think about it is that uh, Courtney 
had the bravery to actually say, you know, if you want a good people and if you want to uh, maintain the level of engagement and interest, they actually doubled, you know, they pretty much doubled overnight. The, their wages had significant increases, maybe not double, but 50%. So um, I, I, if my colleagues agree, it's the first time I bring it up, but I'm, I'm happy, happy for some side chat conversations over the coming months, whether we think that it's proper remuneration for uh, what we do here. And because um, otherwise, I think we'll just keep recruiting uh, people that um, I mean, we have we have good people, but it's just it, it's not it's hard to make it your main concern. And and that saddens me because I love the work. I recognize this full time work involved there. If you're going to read all the reports, participating in all meetings in all the boards and all the external appointments and all the rest of it. Um, I think that the amount of time that we each spend on regional district matters does not reflect um, the, the the wage that we collect. Thanks. Director Greaves. Well, you know, I've, I've made that point for a long time uh, that, you know, the uh, citizens of the electoral areas, um, in my case, about 9,600 people, you know, get a pretty good bang for their buck. And if you're a municipality, 9,600 people, you'd be paying a heck of a lot more. But it's not about the money. You're absolutely right. But it, the recognition, you're never going to get that either. You know, you get all the accolades and praise at the gas station, right, in the grocery stores. No, it doesn't happen. But uh, I did one time, um, about five years ago, I guess, I, I took a, a not... A typical month, but a fairly busy month of October. And I factored in travel time, reading time, meeting time, uh, dealing with uh, with some of the, the constituents time. And it worked out somewhere under 10 bucks an hour. So when you really think of it, you know, but but we're not here for the money, folks. That's for darn sure. Um, my question was around the uh, cost allocation for administration. Way back in the in the horse and buggy days of 2011, um, we had a cost a administration cost allocation report where the uh, senior staff actually tracked what they were working on and allocated it to to the electoral areas that, that were paying into it. And um, I know we don't do that anymore. We sort of do a guesstimation, but. You know, I think when they say that the 60% of the CAO's time is spent on electoral areas, I would think that includes, includes uh, yeah, James. So, you know, I would think that, uh, that we're probably the least of your worries. I mean, how many times do we darken your door? Not not too often. I mean, especially this term where all the, uh, the major chair positions of all the commissions and, and uh, committees are all taken up by Courtney councillors. So, um, you know, we get we get one meeting a month. Just a thought. Victor. Yeah, thanks. And on that point, I think it, it would talk about the time that they spend on projects and, and programs in the rural areas and not necessarily with the director themselves. But uh, but that is a good question. Maybe the CEO can talk about different organizations. I remember when I was in my nonprofit, I literally had to book every hour of my time to different services. And then the next year, we would compare to what happened the year before to give a general idea. And some organizations, they don't do any uh, assignment. But I, maybe the CEO can uh, provide more information on how they account for the 60% that uh, James Stein, for example, that we get. Yeah, what I might do is, uh, Kevin, can you explain the uh, the rationale and how we came up with the allocations and, and, and the background into that? We'll start with that and then provide comment. Yep, I'll certainly take a stab at that. So through the chair to the director. So yeah, the, the allocations, particularly for the CAO and the executive assistant are driven by our support and service and other allocations policy. Uh, Dirk, Dirk Grieve is correct. Uh, you know, that policy was, was approved back in 2012, and that was after some pretty extensive and exhaustive uh, work with the consultant, looking at a number of different uh, variations as to how various regional districts were allocating their general support or general administration costs. Um, the, the policy that we are currently kind of working through uh, was seen at that time as being, you know, one of the best practices out there and really kind of try to hone in on you know, what was really driving the various components of that. Um, 
yeah, so really that's that's you know how it was kind of uh, assessed at that time. Um, I mean, with any any you know policy, it's certainly always open to uh, reconsideration at at some point uh, if the director so desire. Yeah, I would just add it as as uh, Kevin says. It really it was a good foundation for allocating um, the costs across the various services. Every year, we kind of reflect on where we're at and uh, is it working from our perspective? It is. Um, the issue, it's always issues management. And in any, any given year, we can have the smallest of all of our services have something blows up that just, you know, requires us to provide attention to that and then far over and above what that service may be paying for. But that's the nature of local government. So I think over, over the, really over the period of time, you know, four or five years, there's balance with respect to how those issues uh erupt and are supported and how we deal with the work plans and the ongoing day-to-day -day, day things. So I think it works well for us, but certainly it is, is something that we do evaluate and, uh, and, and consider each year as we develop our, our financial plan. And our latest perspective is, is it's working well for us now. Edwin? Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, the good news is that uh, the budget increase is less than 4%. You know, and I think, I think as we, as we, uh, you know, we have to explain to our constituents too that, that you know, the pressures that they're under, um, inflationary pressures, mortgage rates, I mean, groceries, buy ahead of lettuce, folks, you know, and make sure you take your charge card, you know, there's a change in your pocket. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's tough times all around but what people have to realize i think is a fact that we're not immune to those those pressures we're dealing with the same pressures here as a corporation so it's obvious that you know if we if inflation's running 6.9 or whatever that you know we're going to be running about 6.9 too and that's without all the frills and i know i i sometimes showboat a little bit about this and that you know but uh, really i think we're doing a damn good job so thanks There's no other questions except the report. Thank you, Carrie. The recommendation with the middle. With the amendment. No, sorry. Recommendation with, uh, I guess, the, in the communication that it's option A. So I think it reduces the total amount. Is that correct? By about 40,000? Uh, if I may, Chair, so what I would, would suggest for recommendations, if you could approve the proposed uh, and then subsequent have a recommendation to uh, reflect a reduction in the uh, EA engagement by $50,000 uh, in the recommended financial plan, and then we'll certainly make that change. What was the recommendation? Harry? Yeah. And I would move that then be amended by fifty thousand less to reflect the uh, option yeah. of the recommendation. Yeah. There's an amendment option with a seconder. Okay. So the the amendment is is that reduction. So you would uh, debate and then vote on the amendment, and then if that's passed, post vote on the um, recommendation as amended. Terry. Going to vote now? Carried? Not the recommendation as amended, call it again. All in favor? All in favor? Thank you. Amended. Carried. Uh, move seven, new service. Okay. Second it. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors. And James Warren is here to present the uh, the, the budget for Function 560 and answer any of your questions. Welcome, James. Good morning, Directors, and thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, Kevin and I were just making eyes over the table, so I'm not sure if Kevin had more to add to this, but I'll, I'll take a start. Um, this is a, a relatively new service that Directors will recall that we undertook in elect. Uh, 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 elector approval process to uh, request the establishment of this new service and uh, annual authorization bylaw that would provide funding to the to the startup of the installation of fiber on Denman and Hornby Islands. Um, this is all in partnership with City West, um, a municipally owned corporation out of Prince Rupert that is also working on the Connected Coast project. Um, the 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 nuts and bolts of the service is essentially that the the project is well underway. 
installation of the fiber is expected to be complete this this year and uh, and residents on the island will be able to subscribe to the service this year and uh, one upshot for this particular service in the CVRD is that there will be um, uh, revenue sharing that will come from this particular service so uh, all fairly straightforward no changes to the to the requisition as presented Mr. Chair Thank you James Anybody from Hornby or Demonon would like to ask a question or something? Craig Carver? <laughs> yeah, thanks. And, and if you um, if anyone comes to Hornby and Denman right now on Denman Island, you're gonna see fiber uptake just everywhere. Uh, it's the, the roads are just lined and they're digging and it's uh, very exciting. It's also a hard project. It's a lot of uh, ground coverage. And I think uh, sometime this year, they'll be heading over to Hornby. Um, I'd like to highlight that um, with, uh, Minister Hutchings in Ottawa, this was, she says, this is one of the top priorities for rural Canada to connect everybody by fiber. And they're hoping to have 98% of Canadians connected to fiber by 2035, I think. And um, so great to see all our rural areas and areas C coming along with some applications um, and some projects around Duff Creek. And, and I guess my only question is it, you know, for us is to keep in our radar um, who is not connected right now to fiber in our region. If there's any pockets that we know about, we uh, our, our local government should be aware so that we can, because um, the, 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 the big companies, they may not necessarily pursue those tiniest pockets. Uh, so maybe we have full coverage, but uh, if we don't, we should be aware because we may be able to, um, to accelerate the connection be be before 2035 to those areas. Edmund? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, by the time we all get connected, it'll be obsolete. Um, my question is just, uh, is there any news on City West in the Williams Beach road drop? Do we have any information on that? Because I know they were talking about uh, bringing it up that way too, which of course would be great for Miracle Beach, Saratoga, and even Macaulay Road. So the, the Williams Beach drop you're referring to is is part of the Connected Coast project. It's the yeah. under underwater submarine fiber that will run all the way up and down the uh, the west coast of BC, and uh, and Williams Beach is one of those landing sites for for that um, submarine fiber. And uh, I don't have any specific information okay. from City West on the on land portion of it, but it does by by. By having those those drops on land, it allows for the connectivity throughout the throughout the network, and and those drops um, where there isn't um, adequate high speed internet service, it does facilitate the opportunity for for more connectivity. Um, I don't have anything specific on that particular area. So it would be the spine. So you could either have a local service area that we establish either through government or whatever, or private. Correct. At that point, yeah, yeah. So, but no, you no new no news. Thank you. All right, motion to uh, receive, sorry, XI report. Thank you. Thank you. And vote. Oh. Carried. Thank you very much, Chair and Directors, and Derry Monteith has joined us. She will do the presentation for the budgets in items 8, 9, 10, and 11 on the agenda. So we'll just roll with uh, Derry for the next few. There you go, Derry. Welcome. Excellent. Thank you. Um, through the Chair, so starting off with the Jackson Drive Sewer Service. So the Jackson Drive sewer system was built in the early 1980s by a developer to service a 16 lot subdivision shown in the map there on the left. Uh, and this is adjacent to Anderton Road in Electoral Area B. The system after being constructed was subsequently handed over to the regional district for operations and maintenance or management, sorry. It's made up of a small collection system that's then connected to an extended duration treatment plant and a land-based disposal field. 
Uh, the service is funded by an annual parcel tax with a 2023 parcel tax rate of $1,153 per user, which is an approximate 4% increase over the 2022 rate. Uh, the parcel tax rate is then proposed to increase again by another 4% in 2024 and 2025, and then flat through uh, 2027, which is consistent with the parcel tax bylaw that was adopted in 2021. And this bylaw is uh, reviewed and amended every five years and is up for review again in 2025 to ensure that the service requirements are being met and also that adequate reserves are being collected for asset replacement. So there were no major projects uh, undertaken in this service for 2022. Uh, this year in 23, we will be completing a condition assessment of the disposal field, just to confirm timing and scope of the upgrades that are required. Uh, in 2011, $150,000 of community works funds was allocated towards upgrades uh, for both the treatment and disposal systems. However, based on a condition assessment at that time, a complete replacement of this disposal field was not required. Um, and so uh, $60,223 remain of that community works funds towards replacement of the disposal field, which is now planned for 2024. And we will be adding an additional $65,000 uh, in reserves for that project. So as mentioned, the parcel tax rate is proposed to increase in 2023 by $44 per parcel. Uh, the proposed financial plan for the service includes $5,013 for personnel costs, which is required to operate the wastewater treatment plant. And these resources are provided by the CBRD's pool of wastewater operators. Uh, operating costs have increased in 2023 by $4,043 to complete the condition assessment of the disposal field. And um, a contribution to reserves and um, contract services really remain kind of key expenditures for the service. Um, and there's also a small transfer to other functions uh, included in the budget for management fees. And this is transferred to uh, 340 as well as 335 for vehicle usage of the operators. And that's all I have for that one. Any questions? No questions? Oh, sorry, Edwin. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Just, just one. Um, I'm trying to find it here. I know it's in here somewhere, but um, how many units does this serve? It's 16 properties. 16. Goes to show. Thank you. Okay, so we uh, receive recommendations. Thank you. Go. Oh. Thank you. Thanks, Terry. Moving on to the next item. I, I thought I thought we did. Okay, call the vote. I have to say, call the vote. On the vote. Okay, through the chair. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so the King Coho Wastewater Service was established in early 2018 to provide sewage conveyance treatment and disposal to 37 strata units in the King Coho development, which is near the Little River Ferry Terminal. Uh, the CPRD took over ownership in October 2018, so 2019 was the first full year of service operation by the CBRD. Uh, the system includes a rotating biological contactor treatment system, a sand filter, uh, ultraviolet disinfection, and a 400 meter long marine outfall that extends to a depth of 30 meters. Uh, seen in the photo here uh, in the middle is the RBC drum kind of on the right, 
and the small treatment uh, building which houses controls piping and the UV and sand filter. Uh, wastewater treatment plant upgrades were completed for this service in the fall of 2021 and were paid for through a combination of reserves, community works funds and short term borrowing. And uh, with these upgrades now in place, effluent quality has been significantly improved for the service and now meets provincial permit requirements. Uh, the short term debt financing that was secured for the upgrades in 2022 is included in the proposed financial plan for years 2023 through 2026, um, at which time the debt will be fully retired. So 2023 work plan priorities for this service include minor capital repairs and upgrades, including uh, new pumps for the Little River Pump Station, which pumps wastewater from the two strata units on the south side of the Little River to the treatment plant, as well as some remedial work on the marine outfall. And also uh, not listed on the slide here, um, but also included is an assessment of the Little River Force Main Crossing that carries the wastewater from uh, the pump station to the wastewater treatment plant. And pending an outcome um, and recommendations stemming from this assessment, the 10-year capital plan also includes a $60,000 project in 2025 for any remedial work that's required. Uh, requirements uh, to upgrade and operate the system to municipal construction standards, as well as to ensure adequate reserves are being collected, has really resulted in increasing user rate pressures for this service. And unfortunately, we are playing a little bit of catch up for this service because no reserves were transferred to the CBRD at the time of system acquisition in 2018. So the 2023 parcel tax rate for the service uh, is proposed to be $2,085 per user, which is a $298 increase over the 2022 rate, which is then to be followed by a 3.5% increase in years 2024 through 2027. Uh, overall operating costs for the system are proposed to increase in 23 by $27,695. And this change is mainly attributed to the required repairs and upgrades to the pump station and the outfall. And an estimated uh, $211.62 per parcel of debt financing costs are also included, uh, as mentioned earlier, for the prior upgrades to the treatment plant. Uh, the proposed financial plan includes uh, $12,479 in personnel costs for 2023. Again, um, resources are provided by the CBRD's pool of wastewater operators. And the position allocation remains consistent uh, for this year with 10.63% of a wastewater plant operator position allocated to the service. Uh, management of the service is provided by the Liquid Waste Management Planning Service, Function 340, which is reimbursed $1,000 for management fees. And uh, at this time, the reserve balance at the end of 2027 are projected to be uh, 107, or $107,614 for the Capital Works Reserve and $18,302 for the Future Expenditure Reserve. So we are recommending uh, an amendment to the parcel tax bylaw for 2023 to align with the requirements outlined in the proposed financial plan. And it is also recommended that a newsletter for 2023 uh, be sent out um, to uh, residents following this meeting if the, the proposed financial plan is adopted. And um, that's all I have if there's any questions. Director Greens. So, yeah, I mean, we're talking about uh, 2026 being up to $2,392.59. 20, by 2027. Um, and these are only 37 units on this system. So, I guess they're up the proverbial creek. Won't use the whole term. Um, what you can do about this, I mean, obviously there is no choice, you know, that the residents don't really have too much in the way of options, but I noticed there's um, no grant funding in the table. Is there, is there grant funding? Did I miss it? 
Uh-huh. There's community works on 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 the initial, so where it came in, and not on 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 the operations and paying off the capital. That's correct. Uh, through the chair to the director, community works funds were used for the upgrades in 2022, but are are not. There's no community works funds, I guess, being proposed. So they're one off. Okay. Well, it does it does go to show for sure that uh, you know this these small systems are, can be very problematic as time goes by. We've seen that all, all around. It ends up that the uh, regional district has to take them over and, and fix them up. But um, yeah, I mean, that's, you look around uh, uh, the other other properties and I guess they have their, all have their own on-site, which maybe in hindsight would have been a better way to go. Sorry. There's no more questions or comments then. Do we want to have a motion to accept the report? Second. Thank you. Oh, we, we did that. Okay, so we're so call the vote on the various recommendations. There's uh, vote on receipt first. Vote on receipt of the recommendations. Recommendation one. We move them all or get them themselves? Move them all. We'll move all three recommendations. Carrie. Oh, call the vote. Carrie. Carrie, thank you. And the number 10, Darian. Mm-hmm. Who's part of the class? Second. Sounds like a little girl's family. Okay, through the chair. So the uh, Courtney Flats drainage service was created to drain fresh water and limit tidal water intrusion into Dyke Slough. The service was established in 1987 and to address historic drainage and flood problems in the area. Uh, The existing infrastructure consists of three tidal gates, which were installed in 1989 and financed through MFA, and the service area debt was fully retired in 2009. The service is now completely funded by a parcel tax collected from each of the 15 participating properties for operation and maintenance, as well as a contribution to reserves. And the parcel tax rate is $47.90 per hectare with no changes to the current rate included in the 23 to 27 financial plan. Uh, The service area covers approximately 153 hectares in total for a total annual revenue of $7,329. And there's no direct CVRD staff time allocated under this service, but instead management is provided by the liquid waste management planning service function 340, which is compensated in management fees. So the operating budget for 2023 remains consistent with the 2022 budget with only a slight increase in liability insurance. Uh, Key expenditures for 23 include an allowance for contract services for minor maintenance activities, as well as a contribution to reserves. And you'll see in uh, table one of the report that the reserve contribution for 2023 has decreased by 2008. $863 $863 due to less prior year surplus being carried forward, um, which allowed for a higher contribution in 2022. So the service has a combined uh, capital works and future expenditure reserve balance at the end of 2022, estimated at $133,458. A replacement of the title gates is planned for 2027 and will be funded by reserves. And um, consultation with residents, producers, Comox First Nation agency and environmental stakeholders will be really important in uh, advance of the replacement to discuss the best way to operate these uh, tidal gates into the future. 
And um, as we know, climate change will have a significant impact on the service in the future and will also be a key consideration in planning for infrastructure renewal. And uh, happy to take any questions on this service. Edwin? Yeah, this, this uh, particular service is basically a rounding error in the budget. So it's not, it's not a big one, but I'm glad to see they're gonna be looking at uh, reviewing uh, at least and the gate replacement currently planned for 2027 because uh, you know we really don't know what's waiting around the corner. Um, you know, Green Shore initiatives have a spotty record. Uh, we could quite possibly, I mean, traditionally, I remember when the whole dike was flooded and everybody was in canoes. So, I mean, it has happened before that, that the whole flats have been under three feet of water and people in boats. So uh, at least by 2027, we should have a little better idea of, uh, you know, the success or not of, uh, of some of these, uh, these initiatives on, on, the, uh, on the estuary. So yeah, but it's uh, another one we can support without too much worry. Thanks for voting on receipt. Sorry, acceptance of the report. Carrie? Thank you. So vote, call the vote. Thank you, Carrie. Receipt waste management planning service. Thank you. You, uh, through the chair. So the liquid waste management planning function was established in 2002 to provide management staff resources and funding to support liquid waste management planning efforts in the electoral areas. All property owners in the electoral areas pay a tax requisition for this service and there is no change in requisition planned for 2023 with an estimated tax impact of $27.20 for a uh, property assessed at $800,000. The 340 service provides for planning and analysis only with no provision for capital expenditures. And because of this, much of the work completed within the service includes the evaluation of improved wastewater, excuse me, and rainwater management through the creation of new services and the installation of required infrastructure. Uh, professional fees, for many of the planning projects uh, in this service are provided through the ele electoral area feasibility study services. However, staff resources are provided through this function. Uh, function 340, as you've just heard, also provides management services for the Jackson Drive, King Coho and Courtney Flats drainage service. Uh, many of the projects undertaken in this service are complex multi-year and multi-jurisdictional program projects that require significant public stakeholder and uh, First Nations engagement. And the climate crisis is also a significant driver for this service as there are significant implications for water management uh, as a result of climate change. So for 2023, we see many of the projects that we have been working on uh, in 2022 carry forward. Uh, shown in blue on the slide are um, each beside each project listed are the services uh, that are proposed to fund this work. So we will be continuing uh, the development of the sewer extension south liquid waste management plan addendum in 2023 with continued engagement uh, and engineering and design being completed and a draft addendum report is proposed um, to be delivered at the uh, in the middle of quarter four of 2023. Also um, last year, following recommendations from our work in the Solom watershed, we initiated a watershed stewardship scoping study. And this work is proposed to be concluded in 23 with results and recommendations expected to be brought forward in quarter two. Uh, our septic education program is also proposed to continue this year with both virtual and in-person workshops planned for 2023. And we will also be continuing uh, to progress the analysis on mandatory maintenance program for on-site septic systems with recommendations on next steps expected to be brought forward to this committee in uh, quarter two of this year. So 
So in addition to uh, the tax requisition for function 340, there is uh, $216,435 216, transfer from reserves uh, included in the proposed budget to support the sewer extension south LWMP addendum with an additional 155,000 proposed to be added at the recommended budget stage which would uh, equate to a total transfer of $371,435. Uh, the future expenditure reserve for this service is really important for, for projects such as the LWMP addendum, as it can um, really help to offset the cost of these large planning projects that would otherwise require an increase in tax requisition. As of uh, December 31st, 2022, the reserve fund balance for the service is projected to be $586,716. Uh, this is the result of less funding being withdrawn in 2022 uh, than was budgeted with $12,347 in anticipated withdrawals versus a $300,000 budget. And that's due to an operational surplus in the service. So if the total recommended transfer is approved um, from reserves, it would result in a projected reserve fund balance at the end of 2023 of $215,281. Uh, additionally, if the recommended transfer is approved, we would see an increase in operating costs uh, for 2023 of $15,964, as opposed to the decrease that's shown in the table in your report. With that, I uh, welcome any questions. Daniel? Yeah, thanks. Um, that's a, uh, obviously a you know, sizable service. It's, it's, you know, I was happy to see the decrease in the budget, but really it's not a decrease in the requisition. So uh, for the ratepayers, it's no different. But um, such important projects that are underway, I think um, there's a lot of anticipation on my part around the um, potential septic regulation that we might look at uh, based on the strategy uh, produced last year. Obviously, the uh, addendum in the south um, is, a, is a key piece um, towards moving a fairly important project in the south in partnership with Comox, First Nation, and Union Best States. I didn't see a lot of, um, oh, sorry, the watershed. I need, to, I, <laughs> thank you for saying it. it'll be in quarter two. I, um, I, uh, Hornby Water Stewards uh, keep asking me around when we're going to have something like Nanaimo, and I'm not sure if we're even heading in that direction or if it'll be more like solemn type projects. Um, but I know there's a lot of discussion in the community around the potential for watershed service and what it could mean to support people in the transition, uh, both from a wastewater and also water perspective. Uh, I even met a, a water co-op last week in Fannie Bay that I didn't know existed. And it was so neat to go and visit them and learn about how they're doing water bottling uh, in, in a small community, but under a co-op system. And they've created a set of criteria. So there's a lot of interests around uh, both watershed uh, and, uh, and management thereof. The one thing I didn't see uh, highlighted in this presentation is really all the work around Saratoga and uh, Director Greaves area. I know that um, it's a long-standing issue and, and I, I just wanna make sure that it's not missed in as part of our efforts, if staff have comments. Yeah, certainly through the chair. Um, our work definitely um, is proceeding in Saratoga, but it is really dependent on um, the developer and uh, how quickly they're going to progress. Uh, their work in the area, so it it's on the list. Um, it wasn't listed as uh, kind of one of our top priorities, but certainly we'll continue work in that area. Yeah, of course, this is a very difficult one to explain to the residents. When you say liquid waste management, it's kind of like you know the uh, it's it's kind of that and other stuff too. In fact, it's it's as you say, it's more more planning than anything else. Um, and when you get into planning around water and and uh, rainwater, stormwater, all that stuff, then you run into uh, the provincial government basically moti and having to deal with um, the people that own the ditches and the culverts and the bridges. And uh, you know, and 
I know that we've spent a lot of money on the Lasso Flats over the years and and had to shelve it. And uh, I'm just hoping that the uh, Saratoga Beach doesn't end up with the same kind of fate. But it is, uh, you know, we are, as I often said, we're not masters in our own house. We have to absolutely rely on provincial government cooperation to get this stuff to move forward. But um, yeah, it's it's a it's a big budget, and uh, it's very very difficult one to actually explain to people because they they think it it basically means sewers, right? And it, it doesn't. Um, but obviously. Uh, it is what it is what it is and uh i've you know i've been puzzling over this one for the entire almost 15 years i've been elected but so it'd be nice to see some del deliverables out of it some successes i don't know what they look like but um something you can point a finger to would be great thank you thank you just subsequent I'd, I'd be remiss if i didn't say that uh I think I take part of the Bain Sun Ecosystem Forum still and uh, that broad stakeholder group. And every time uh, shellfish growers and others remind us of the important need to do a better job around uh, septic management. And it really falls, yes, to Island Health. But I think if we just left it to Island Health, it'd be status quo. So local government providing leadership is really important. And I, I'd like to say uh, one good idea that happened in the last few months. I don't know if uh, I'm sure there's good internal communication, but it came from our deputy CAO and we were visiting the um, uh, um, waste manage, um, wastewater management facility. And, you know, he ended up saying, wouldn't it be nice because we're looking where the trucks bring the septic from all the rural areas and the rest of that. And it was like, wouldn't it be nice if people just kind of just had it on their taxes, you know, for the, the mandatory septic empty out. And every three to five years, you know, you get, you amortize your 300 bucks. So maybe it's five, 50, 60 bucks a year. I think it, it'd be, um, and, and, and again, it's a bit like the, um, I hate to bring it up, but the garbage and recycling issue where um, if local government provides the solution that really makes it easy for people, um, I think there's an opportunity there to turn something that sometimes my residents look as, as a negative into something that could turn into something um, that really um, is easy and is a great service for people. So I look forward to, to the recommendations. Thanks. So call and vote on acceptance of the report. Carrie, thanks. Move recommendation. Second. Thank you. Call the vote on the uh, recommendation. Carried. Thank you. Apparently, uh, we're going to take a little lunch break. No. All right, let's do it. Back in 10. Back in 10? Yes. Okay. Thanks, Jerry.
All right, we're going to get back into it. Number 12. Receipt for the Sarah Thank you. 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 And uh, Mr. Chair and Directors, the next two reports, Demon Island and the Graham Lake Water Systems, uh, Chris LaRose will present both of these budgets and answer your questions. Thanks, Chris. Great. Thanks, Russell. And through the chair. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Thanks, Lisa, for putting up the presentation. So I have developed a, a very brief presentation to help walk us through the proposed financial plan for the Demon Island Water Local Service Area. So the system was constructed uh, in, in the late 60s by a private developer and then became a regional district service shortly thereafter due to some ongoing water quality concerns. Um, the system consists of 24 properties, 22 of which are using water, two of them have opted out of the service or out of, out of, out of the water connection. Um, in 2018, I guess backing up, um, you know, I think it was 2012, 2011, um, a connection between the Graham Lake Improvement District and Demon Island Water Local Service Area was made to replace the previous well system that this service had. Um, and so between that point and 2018, there was a, uh, a system whereby Graham Lake set a annual kind of a, a volumetric rate for the, for the subsequent year. Um, under a water supply agreement, and that went through until 2018, but there were problems with that system. Um, there was a bit of a spiraling situation where every year our user would, would use a little bit less water, and so they would increase the rate and it would just make it worse and worse. Um, so in 2018, we revised the water supply agreement um, and, uh, and started charging Devon Island Water Local Service Area residents the same cost per connection as Graham Lake. And at that same at that same point, uh, GLID became or took over day to day operation of the service, just given the remote nature and the distance from our own uh, the rest of our operations. And then, so yeah, as of January first, twenty three, uh, of course, Graham Lake has become a regional service, as we'll get into on the next item. Um, and so now we effectively manage both services. So we've, we plan to keep the same, the same arrangement in place, uh, at least for 2023, pending the outcome of big important decisions and discussions on uh, the future of this service and, 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 and Graham Lake as well. Uh, so in the interim, revenue for the service is collected through a flat rate, which is matched to GLIDS and then transferred to, uh, to Graham Lake. Uh, with the exception of a, of a thousand dollar fee that we we res have reserved traditionally for covering the administrative cost of this service, and so there is an intention or in acknowledgement of the of the, the fact that these services are, are you know, next to each other, they they both face the same many of the same issues, um, and that they're just it makes a lot of sense to be working regardless of, of of which path we take forward. It makes sense for them to be a single service, so so uh, we do plan to work with uh, with you to towards potential amalgamation of the services. So, you know, within the service itself, not a, not a lot going on. Um, this this was the the the, um, the service from which we were providing support to the Grand Lake Improvement District for their conversion process, just in the interest of, um, you know, of, of, of the Demon Island Water Local Service Area users in terms of um, source water and, and security. Um, we also supported the Graham Lake Improvement District Treatment Pilot Project, which I'll touch on more on the, the next presentation. With Convergent now behind us in 23, looking ahead, we'll be reviewing options for Graham Lake uh, regulatory compliance and um, determining a path forward for both of these services and, uh, and likely initiating amalgamation of the two services. The, the um, the map on the right just shows the the uh, purple and purple Graham Lake, um, and then blue at the bottom, Devon Island Water Local Service Area, and in between, previously highlighted in orange and referred to as the extension area. Um, at the, by this point, you know there's there's been a 
several of those homes that have uh, have joined the Dem and Island Water Local Service Area, and the rest don't appear to be interested in water. So the, the two service areas are not exactly contiguous. There we go. So yeah, it's a pretty straightforward um, budget summary table for this service. Um, we re we received the revenue in from the user fees collected from the users um, and pass all but a thousand dollars over to um, well previously to the Graham Lake Improvement District and now to the Water Local Service Area. Yeah, from a, just a, in summary, I've kind of structured this around the um, the core strategic drivers. Um, from a fiscal responsibility perspective, we'll continue to operate um, DILSA to minimize cost to the users and assess options for um, including DILSA water treatment upgrades and opportunities for amalgamation and the efficiencies that that'll generate. Um, from a climate crisis and environment perspective, nutrient treatment system is being selected to ensure resilience to the local impacts of climate change in terms of water quality um, and water quantity in this area. And then of course, the, the conversion itself is the result of a, a long collaborative process between the CVRD and the, and the trustees and residents of, of Devon Island who, are, who participate in these services. And uh, throughout this process, we continue to keep the Kamosh First Nation involved or up to date updated on um, on the water treatment project um, and the potential of bulk water supply um, to Denman Island. That's it. I, that's it for this service, but I'm happy to support the discussion or answer any questions. No questions. Okay. Do we uh, vote on uh, acceptance of the report? Carrie, thank you. Um, so vote on the recommendation. Carrie? Move three, ten. Second. Thank you. Okay, great. <clears throat> so launching right into uh, the new Graham Lake Water Local Service Area, Function 310. So the 23 to 27 financial plan. So a little bit of background. So the service, as I mentioned, is, is now um, formally established as of January 1st. There are, um, as opposed to the 24 properties in Devon Island, there's 66 properties in this service area. The source water comes from Graham Lake, as you would imagine, um, with, with a relatively low level of treatment um, before distribution to, to its service area and then sending water over to Devon Island system. So uh, several years ago, Island Health informed Graham Lake that they needed to work towards compliance with the service water treatment objectives. So this was a, a, a several years um, later than some of the larger community systems, such as our own here in the, in the, in, in the valley, um, but in line with uh, some of the other smaller systems that we've seen around the, the valley as well, like Watuko, for example. Um, revenue for the service is collected through a, um, well, typically, historically through a toll and a, and a user rate, this year entirely through a user rate, um, but the latter four years of the plan through a combination of parcel tax and user rate. So looking over the last year, we there was a fair bit of effort on the staff's part to support the GLEED conversion process, including development of a financial model to estimate the financial impact of conversion. So directly attributed to the shift from kind of the volunteer run improvement district to, um, to CBRD managed system, as well as implementation of the treatment project. 
um, and um, asset, asset management for the system, as I'll get onto in a later slide. Um, we also supported GLID's treatment pilot study to assess um, the preferred treatment technology. Looking ahead to this year, this first year um, as a regional system, our first focus, of course, will be on integrating the Graham Lake system and contract operators into the CBRD water operations to ensure that we continue to meet regulatory requirements for delivery of water. Um, but we'll also be reviewing options for um, the surface water treatment objectives compliance um, and determining a preferred path forward. And then likely initiating some form of electoral assent process for the long-term borrowing that will be required um, for uh, delivery of the, of, of the preferred solution and initiating amalgamation with a Denver Island Water Local Service Area. So this being the first year of CDRD management of this service, there's uh, it's not much of a comparison. Um, although I, I can tell you that um, what we have in front of us is is effect is is really um, converted over from the adopted budget that uh, that Glid um, brought forward in, in November of last year. Um, and there's a bit of massaging to get it into the CDRD format, um, but the bottom line is the same. Um, prior to um, the conversion, Glid uh, did pass the required bylaw change to increase the annual uh, revenue per parcel per water consuming parcel to 1600. Um, and then structured this, uh, this their budget, their approved 23 budget based on that increased revenue. So we've taken the same bottom line and and, um, and adapted it to our to our own budgeting format. Sorry, just bear with me. Let's jump here around. Okay, just focusing in on the biggest, the biggest project, the biggest topic for the service is definitely the compliance with provincial regulations. Um, so the, the water treatment project um, is required by the province. Um, it's uh, attracted a $1.46 million senior level grant funding, which at the time of application represented that roughly 75%. Um, since then, along with almost every other infrastructure project we've we've had, we've seen an inflation escalation of costs. Um, we've also had a, a change in technology as uh, the, the technology that was submitted as part of that grant application um, was subsequently proven in another application to not be the, the right choice here. So a shift in technology and the escalation in construction costs has pushed it up to 3.2 million. Um, so putting that grant fraction just below 50%. Um, per the um, outcome of the January, 30, January 30th meeting of the EASC, we are working on an assessment of options to move forward um, and we'll be reporting back to the EASC in, in March or April. But I uh, just wanted to, to highlight very, very clearly that regardless um, of which option is selected, you know, if we, um, electoral assent would be required uh, to authorize any required long-term borrowing. So any you know decision on a preferred path forward is just that it's a preferred path forward. The community will have that, uh, that final say. So in addition to the water treatment project, which is um, which is a, a really, really big project for such a small service area, we also have to consider the other infrastructure. Um, and so when we put our minds to developing the pro forma that was attached to the January 30th report, and that was in November with uh, with the Graham Lake um, trustees, we, we, we wanted to ensure that um, you know, there weren't any surprises post conversion. So, you know, at the CVRD, we do have a, a strong focus on asset management, looking, you know, farther out, um, extending the horizon for, for capital um, replacements. Um, and we know that this service, um, the infrastructure, so the example shown on the right here is um, four inch asbestos cement pipe. That infrastructure is nearing the end of its lifespan. So, within the pro forma and within the financial plan, 
is um, uh, funding for reserve contributions to help um, achieve that 50-50 split that's mentioned at the bottom there between reserves and debt at the time of anticipated replacement. So these pipes are within 10 to 15 years away from, from their end of life. Um, and so almost equal to the impact of the borrowing for the water treatment project is the reserve contributions that are required for the service to ensure that when those pipes reach the end of the life, um, the service isn't overly burdened with additional debt. So embedded within the proposed budget is um, an allocation of community works funds. Um, and within the staff report, we have included a proposed motion allocating um, community works funds a, a total of $200,000, ADK towards uh, a contribution to, to, to form a contribution from the Demon Island Water Local Service Area to the Graham Lake Water Treatment Project to equalize the per, per connection reserve money. So this was an item that was identified early on in the conversion process as being a, a point of inequity. So um, that contribution would resolve and equalize those per connection reserve amounts. And then the second piece, the larger piece would be allocated generally to the project to help reduce cost impact to all users. I just make a note that the motion in the report refers to the um, area B, or, sorry, uh, Demon and Horby Island CWF funds, which um, we've realized are potentially oversubscribed. So we want to suggest that that be reworded to um, the area A CWF as the potential source of, uh, of those funds. And uh, finally, just before we end here, just a, a slide summarizing the very significant impact anticipated to the cost per connection on, on the island. Um, so 23, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, uh, the cost for those properties that are receiving water has gone up to 1,600 from 1,400 last year, uh, with uh, an increase from five to 700 for those properties not receiving water or opting out of water. So the top table just uh, summarizes the number of connections, just showing that um, you know, there are two in in uh, yeah two in Graham. Uh, sorry, sorry, those top two um, row headers are are reversed. So Graham Lake has sixty seven total, one opting out. Um, Demon Island has twenty four total, with two opting out, and. Uh, Reflected on the bottom is um, is as summarized in the the, uh, the proposed plan, which shows the 1600 bottom line for 23, but with that escalating significantly next year as we start to um, put money away into the reserve, uh, the capital works reserve for the long term asset replacement. And then another step up in 2026, which is the anticipated end date of the water treatment project to the point at which any short-term debt would be converted to uh, the long-term debt. And so that's, uh, yeah, and then it levels off at, at that point. Yeah, and then in, in closing, uh, similar, very similar to the last. So only thing I'll here I'll, I'll I'll highlight is just the um, although the proportion of grant funding to the total project cost has decreased with the escalation in costs, you know that grant funding does still provide a, a significant um, reduction in cost to the to the users beyond what regulatory compliance would would otherwise be costing. Um, and we are committed to working with the committee and and um, and the residents to find the optimal path forward for the service area. Happy to answer any questions or discussion. Ken. Yep. Thank you, Chair, and thanks to staff for the work on this um, and to the GLID trustees. It's a uh, it's been a lot of work. I'm, 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 I fully recognize, especially for the, the trustees that have walked here for a very long time to try to find solutions for this system. You're funny. Um, and, um, and yeah, I, um, you know, I've been reflecting the last, since the uh, January report and, um, 
the medium income on Denman Island is per household is $56,000 a year, right? And so now we're at $4,400 plus the $3,000 of taxes that they pay for their services would bring them up to the $7,600, $8,000. If you think about that being the median and you think about long-time residents that have lived on the island and already struggle with their property taxes, this kind of hit is significant. Um, at the cost, the projected cost of connection per house at 44, you know, $4,4400 a year. Um, over 10 years, that's we'll agree that's $44,000. Um, I can assure you that we can, those residents can uh, dismantle the system and move to rainwater, collect rainwater, or in some places, dig wells, et cetera. I think there's many other options than to, um, <laughs> to just go by the narrow uh, path that is dictated in a way by regulation and by the status quo of pushing on a system that just doesn't seem to have the scale to make. I, one of your slide, your key slide was to manage the system in a sustainable manner. Okay, sustainable manner has three dimensions and one of them is financial. That is not a sustainable system. So at some point, I would like to see some of the options to consider the dismantling of the system and what that would mean for how residents and island health could respond, either through well or rainwater collection or individual strategies. For me, um, and there's still a lot of questions. I, I see this is the perfect project that could turn into a bigger white elephant. And, and I'm not sure about the hydrological work uh, we've completed around Graham Lake, but we saw seashell is dry. A lot of lakes are drying around our area and Denman and Hornby will be one. I imagine in a climate world is gonna be really affected uh, by the climate trend. And so there's question marks where you build this $3 million treatment plant and who knows, right? Uh, I don't wanna create fear. It just, I, I just I just know what some of the one counselor I met from seashell was saying and what they're facing right now. So I would pump the brakes on the project until we really dig um, the options and investigate them fully. Um, I, I would definitely not allocate the community works funds to advance the, the capital project at this time. And I would certainly not use area A community works funds for this. Uh, the people of Union Bay have their own challenges. The people of Royston have their own challenges. I don't know why they would contribute money to a, a, a hundred homes on Denman Island uh, that just receive a $1.3 million grant when in Union Bay, they just built a water treatment plant without any financial support. So there's no way the rest of area is gonna contribute to the solution. And for Hornby and Denman, community works, as you know, are very precious and can be attributed to a number of projects. I see the people in this hundred homes benefiting from a $1.3 million contribution that would primarily serve them. I don't know why we would throw more. It's it's It could start to look like throwing good money after potentially bad money if the capital project just doesn't make sense in the end or if it gets voted down. Uh, I would not make those allocations now. So I would say I wouldn't make an allocation of community works if we're allowed on design or investigation of options to push with Allen Health for rainwater or for wells or dismantling. I would be happy to put some money so that we don't just do a cursory review. <laughs> and I know staff probably already said, you know, Director Arbor, you'll be forced probably to do this, this big capital project and, and the community as well. There may not be options outside, but I don't want us to go in with that attitude. I want us to say, okay, there's been years of effort towards this water treatment plant. The numbers don't pan out. So now what, right? And if at the end of that, that really the province tells us there's no way or the hydrological capacity, the groundwater, there's no way or rainwater, there's no way and we're forced then you have a vote on the capital expenditure. I just don't feel that we've done the dismantling of the system option really well or that GLID has as well. Um, so that'd be my comment for today. The rest of the report, I think all the steps you're taking are the right steps. I, I think you're uh, both with the trustees and yourself, you've been advancing it is just the surprise of finding that final amount, if the, if it was half the amount, which it used to be, tough pill to swallow. We saw with King Coho, that's what they had to do, but that's 4,400 a year. Oh my goodness. Everyone I talked to is just horrified. Thanks. 
Yeah, the, the only thing I'll, I'll say in, in response, and thank you very much for your for your comments, um, is just that we are so we are committed to to bringing back that review of of other options. So that that is in the works. Um, at this point, we see that as an internal assessment uh, without the need for consultant dollars. Um, but we we've, we've already reached out to Island Health and we've we've engaged started that conversation with with them about um, about options and alternatives. So that will be embedded in, in our response. Um, so I, I guess I suggest that um, if uh, if what we bring back is of sufficient you know detail, which we, we I mean our intention is to bring back an assessment that is sufficient to, on which to base a, a decision moving forward. But if the if the, the feeling at that point is that uh, you know further detail is warranted, <laughs> we can make that uh, that call then. Yeah. Edwin. Yes, um, if there was a light at the end of the tunnel, I think uh, Area C would be willing to help out with our community works funds. Um, but uh, some of the issues raised by the director, you know, are are the unforeseen consequences of the Drinking Water Protection Act. And when they did bring that out, there was a lot of small communities at UBCM small service uh, service areas that couldn't meet the regulations. <clears throat> One of the things that was brought forward was the possibility of supplying untreated water and treating it at point of entry. But the, uh, the ministry at the time was like this. No, this is the way we're gonna do it, you know, and this is what happens with senior government. So I think Perhaps Daniel brought a good point up when he said, you know, if we can spend some money maybe on lobbying the government again, this is like what 10 years, 12 years after the after the initial act, about doing that, about you know, uh, what are what are the options? You're not allowing, you're not really allowing, you know, rainwater capture. Though I know a lot of places do use it, they UV it and, and do use it as potable water, but it's not really supported. So, I mean, the government has to be made to realize that, that, that there's a whole segment out there that, that just doesn't fit in that nice square hole. But maybe a pilot project or something like that, much like the uh, compost toilets. And maybe there's something we can go along that line. Personally, I think, you know, there's nothing wrong with delivering unpotable water if you didn't have to carry the liability associated with it. If it's point of entry and they don't have their point of entry up to snuff, then it's on your property. You know, it's, it's your responsibility. I know um, out in my area, almost everybody has UV treatment on their wells, you know, especially being a, just surface water and it really is heavy clay out there and there's a lot of water, water, water just sitting on top. So you don't go down to any water table, the water comes in from the sides. <clears throat> so I don't know, this is gonna, um, this this calls for some extraordinary measures. It calls for some out of the box thinking and, and uh, some frank discussion with uh, senior government officials uh, about what is possible and what isn't possible, what could be possible. So as I say, I mean, if, there, if this was a, a slam dunk and it was only money, I think, you know, possibly the other electoral areas could could stump up a little bit to help out. But it looks to me like it's, um, you know, maybe it's a, a two tissue era. So vote on the uh, acceptance of the report. Carried. Uh, motion in regards to receive of the recommendation. Motion to defer the recommendation. I can hear the grinding of my beer. <clears throat> Director Arbor. Before we move this, so um, recommendation one is really a bit like the Denman Island water service area in the sense that this is just uh, approving the uh, 
proposed budget for function 310, basically on a status quo basis. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. Um, the proposed plan does include the community works funds embedded within it. This motion was to action that. Mm -hmm. So maybe a question for Kevin, if- um, um, Mr. Chair, if that's the case, if community works is part of this, then I say you refer this to the next EA and we come back to you. So maybe I can use the operating budget today and then uh, for the community works uh, to leave that. Uh, just for the change of information that's happened here without us being able to digest it as a group, I would suggest you refer it to the next EA. And, and so refer we'll this to the next, move to, as Dr. Grief said, move to refer to the next EA. Um, with direction to staff is clear enough. Thank you. So I want to vote on the referral. Carrie? Receipt from the Avenue of Peace Disposal Service. And Mr. Mr. Thank you, Chair, Vivian Shaw, a senior manager of uh, solid waste, is joining us to present three budgets, 15, 16, and 17 on the, no, pardon me, 14, 15, and 16 on the budget. Welcome, Vivian. Good afternoon through the CAO to the chair and the AOC. AOC. Uh, the Hornby Island, uh, the, sorry, next slide. The Hornby Island Refuse Disposal Service uh, was established back in 1972, and it's provided under an agreement with HERA, the uh, Hornby Island Resident and Ratepayer Association. Uh, they provide the disposal and recycling service for residents of the Hornby Island. And uh, HERA works with the residents uh, to really set the service levels, uh, establish costs, and passes those along to the CBRD for implementation. And the, re the revenues that are um, generated for the service is entirely funded through tax requisitions with no other revenue sources. And the um, depot is fully, it's a full service depot for all recycling components. The, this is the summary of the 2023 budget. Uh, the operating costs for the service uh, are proposed to decrease in 2023 by roughly about $20,000. This decrease is largely attributed to the reduction of staffing uh, at the free store, which is no longer required um, to manage the, the traffic and mask mandate uh, stemming from the COVID-19 uh, safe health and safety measures. And the proposed tax requisition for 2023 will remain, sorry, is proposed to remain at $400,000 with no change from 2022. The tax requisition is expected to decrease in 2024 uh, down to 360, uh, 362,000 with the modest uh, annual increases uh, through up to 200, uh, 2027 to a total of 200, or sorry, $390,000. On the expenditure, on the expenditure side, the operating line item is made up of the uh, requested operational grant from HERA, uh, insurance and a minor contingency for legal. Uh, totaling just over 411000 And under the transfer to other functions, there are two line items. Uh, this includes the delivery of the service under contract by HERA, which is overseen by Jesse Lee, the manager of uh, the CSWM operations. While there is no direct uh, HR component, uh, this is a transfer uh, to other functions, to the CSWM function in the amount of $4,000 to offset uh, his time to administer this contract. Uh, and then the balance of $450 is the new internal cost of carbon uh, charged at $160 per ton uh, of uh, carbon dioxide emissions. And this is approved through the CBRD SEEP. And uh, this new line item for the 2023 budget will fund the carbon reduction projects across the CBRD services. And finally, there is uh, an $8,859 contribution to reserves. Uh, the capital uh, for 2023 is the is earmarked for uh, the uh, free store breezeway uh, at an estimated cost of twenty five thousand, and this is intended to protect um, the donated items from elements uh, or the uh, do sorry the donated reusable items. Okay. 
And this is just to provide a quick summary of what we just discussed here. Uh, the proposed tax requisition is uh, slated to maintain be maintained at 400,000 and the tax rate of um, per 100,000 of assessed value is decreasing from zero, uh, zero, 41 cents in 2022 to uh, 37, 38 cents in 2023, uh, roughly about a 9% decrease. And so the tax impact on a, a property valued at roughly about 800,000 will be $302.96. And the uh, the only capital projects for 2023 earmarked is uh, the $25,000 for the free store. And that's it for Warren BM available for any questions. Director right, Arbor. Yeah, thank you for the report. And uh, this is a service that has definitely uh, escalated in cost a lot over the last five years. I think when I started as an elected official, we were at 140 or 160 in requisition. We're not 400. And um, there's been a lot of improvements at uh, the recycling center since that time, and also uh, better uh, wages, which was probably overdue, and the unionization over there that has happened. But Definitely, it's it's uh, it's one that sticks out in people's taxes on Hornby Island, and I think there's some pride as well that goes with the uh, Hornby Recycling Depot. So that softens the blow for a lot of residents. Um, to Vivian, like, can you comment? Um, and I'll have one more comment before you can answer. But uh, you know, is the rate of recycling like this a success in recycling and diversion? There's a there's a sense that on Hornby we have better recycling outcomes than elsewhere. So if you're able to comment on that. Because some people might think, and I, myself as a director, when I go to the broader regional table, sometimes it's a little more expensive to get great outcomes. So you, maybe you'll comment on that. And while we have you here, we committed to a lot of stuff today that is not motion or, or otherwise, but you might be, get a big order for Skyrocket coming up for Couscousum. <laughs> and um, there was a second one. There was uh, Parks. I think uh, Robin and Mark were presenting and they talk about uh, demolishing the um, the viewing point. So what they meant is they're going to deconstruct. <laughs> and I think that could be an example of how to do deconstruction. We're talking a lot about that rather than, than smash everything up. So uh, that's another one for your service. But if we can go back to Hornby uh, for the Hornby taxpayers, um, is there that sense that we are getting much better recycling outcomes than other uh, rural areas? Hornby Island uh, is definitely the, the the service that's always touted as the, the hallmark of recycling um, in within our service area. Uh, it is the, the sorry the service that's run by uh, Stani is remarkable. The the amount of recycling that does come through the depot. I don't have those numbers offhand, but it is definitely um, much higher compared to some of the other communities. Uh, so which again is re reflective of the, the budget uh, that is presented before you today. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's definitely an elevated level of service compared to some of the other communities in that respect. Mr. Grees? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, I think that uh, just for my clarity, um, Hornby Island, they don't have like garbage pickup, correct? Everybody takes their garbage to the to the the tipping station or whatever. The, okay, and then they they don't get MMBC or Recycle BC rebates either, right? Are they do that on their own through the staff? Yeah, the, uh, they do receive Recycle BC incentives uh, through their contracts, um, and that's to partially fund uh, some of the Recycling Depot operations. Okay, so they are. Okay, well, you know, it's uh, it, it gets gets to be a lot of money. I've actually canceled my my rural garbage pickup because it was going up in leaps and bounds after the last alternate approval process um, was uh not supported, uh, it doubled, basically. 
So now I just put it in my wood stove along with my wet wood that I pulled off the beach. I'm just kidding, folks. No, now I actually uh, just take it up to to the uh, landfill myself, and it's 10 bucks. Thank you very much. You know, you take three cans up there or whatever. So, you know, it's becoming quite a racket um, when you actually look at it. It's, uh, it's, it's a lot of money. I guess it, it put in those terms, it, you know, 302 bucks without any pickup, you know, just to take it somewhere. Yeah. Anyway, so the, thanks for that. I just wanted to get clear. So is there a motion to charge Evan Greaves like three or four times the amount for tipping garbage? I probably should have just said that. That's what I'm getting at. We'll, we'll charge you when you go to when you go to the dump. Um, so, any more questions? No. So, do we want to vote on acceptance of the report? Thank you. So, vote on recommendation. Carried. Number fifteen, Vivian, please. Oops, sorry, Daniel. Thank you so much. Uh, this is the budget for the Denman Island uh, Garbage Collection Service uh, Function 362. Uh, the Denman Island Garbage Collection Service is uh, provided under agreements with the Denman Island uh, Ratepayer Association. This service is to provide, I'm oh, sorry, is provides the resident of Denman Island uh, curbside collection as well as the disposal of waste hauled directly to the Comox Waste Management Center in Cumberland as well as the operation of the uh, Recycling Depot on Denman Island. Um, similar to the Hornby service, uh, revenues from the recyclables are usually, or sorry, are partially to use to fund the operation of the depot. And then under the Unified uh, Transportation Agreement with under the CSWM banner, uh, the CBRD assumes the legal possession of the recyclables and therefore it's captured under the recyclable, uh, Recycle BC Statement of Work. Uh, for the transportation of the, the recyclables off island. Uh, for the revenues, the proposed uh, 2023 tax requisition is $105,000, which is a decrease of $22,500 from the 2022 uh, tax requisitions. There are no transfers from uh, reserves to offset the operational cost, which has been earmarked in this uh, five-year financial plan. And for the expenditures, the uh, primary cost for the service is really uh, just the operational grant uh, that's provided to DIRA, um, which is again a decrease of roughly about twenty-three thousand, or sorry, roughly about twenty-four thousand compared to twenty twenty-three. Uh, in the future years, the expended or sorry, the operational grant is anticipated to stay uh, re relatively flat uh, for 2024, uh, with an increase of up to 106,000 uh, starting in 2023 to 2027. And uh, this proposed budget here includes provision for the annual uh, maintenance of the buildings and equipment. Uh, for future, future capital uh, expenditures, uh, there are there is nothing uh, earmarked for 2023, uh, but there it is noted that the uh, recycling depot roof is in dire needs of repair, um, and based on the initial uh, structural engineering assessment, uh, the existing building does not meet building code. So in order to conduct the necessary re necessary re repairs, uh, it is required that we bring the, uh, the building up to code in order to make that repair. So 
the, the preliminary assessments, an estimate came back at roughly about 80,000. And uh, currently there is no provision for that um, under the major facility repair budget within this function. Uh, we do want to note that uh, we are currently undertaking a solid waste management plan, uh, which is a comprehensive review of the waste management strategy um, within our service. And really, again, an opportunity to look at ways to advance um, our waste diversion goals. And we, uh, through this process, we're going to be looking at uh, funding mechanisms for the communities within the service area and review kind of what services and programs uh, should be funded through the CSWM uh, function 391. Um, and this process will help determine the responsibility and replacement for some of these um, much needed critical infrastructure. Uh, so in summary, uh, uh, DEER took, undertook a competitive procurement process uh, last year for its new curbside collection uh, contract, which resulted in a pretty significant savings of uh, $22,500 uh, as compared to the 2022 budget, So, which is, the, which is the reason why we're seeing a bit of a decrease in terms of the tax requisition. Um, but the other operating costs within the service are remaining essentially unchanged. Um, yeah, so based on the 2023 completed assessment role, the estimated tax uh, rate for 2023 will be uh, 0 0.1223 per thousand dollars of assessed value. And uh, for a property ass assessment assessed at roughly about 800,000, uh, this will equate to $97.84. And again, there's no proposed capital works for 2023. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Um, it might be fun to get an intern to do a comparative study of the Denman and Hornby approach, uh, both in terms of cost and recycling outcomes, because obviously the residents of Denman, but I understand there's a, actually our, our total budget for Hornby probably included the, uh, the tipping revenue. I didn't see that in this one because I imagine it goes to the private contractor. So, because they get pickup on Denman, they get garbage yes. pickup. So I think they buy tags. Uh, but it'd be interesting because they pay a third in requisition than the Hornby service. So it'd be interesting to see in a future presentation the recycling rates because they're, they're the same size of communities. They're, they both have about 1,200 people. So it might be, although in the summer it explodes on Hornby, so that would skew the numbers. But it'd be, uh, from a study perspective, um, obviously, I think the people of, the, of Denman seem to be getting a great deal. And not only that, a 17% decrease in the coming year. Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I'd be curious to, to look at outcomes between the two islands. And in regards to the um, eighty thousand for the building, I'm supportive. They're they're really if if we have a way to um, to help with that, that would be great because they're really crammed. I mean, they're they've got the farmers market, the recycling center, like it's all condensed in one this one tiny area. And uh, when you think about the amount of space we get on Orby for people to do, do their recycling like them and accomplishes a lot in a very small space. So very happy to uh, to see if there's a proposal that can come forward towards, uh, you know, helping the, the building, the renewal of the building uh, happen. Thanks. Thanks, Director Harbour. I was going to ask a, a question in regards to the uh, $80,000 for the, the new building, but if I understand correctly from your presentation, uh, there's a decrease in the requisition of twenty thousand dollars this year, twenty thousand plus. I'm just wondering again why we would decrease the requisition, with the idea of knowing that we need to uh, put up a new building in the next little while here. That eighty thousand dollars is entirely. It's a preliminary assessment, and whether or not it's worth. We we went through the exercise to identify whether it's worthwhile to save the building um, and what it's gonna to take to shore it up um, and take uh, so that we can undertake the necessary repairs. Um, we can certainly take a look at maintaining that budget, but uh, there, is, uh, there isn't a, a, enough of a, a, a reserve in order to be able to conduct that repair on, entirely on its own right now. So we would have to go through potentially other means to be able to assess those funds. 
So, so, so you're talking to the ecologically not so smart. So I'm still trying to understand why there's a decrease in the requisition uh, for funds for that particular service over there when we already know that whether it's going to be 80000 or 100000 or $10, why would we decrease the requisition right now? Why wouldn't we maintain it? Sorry, I was looking right when I should have been looking left. That's quite all right. Uh, through the chair to the directors, um, you know, certainly we're, we're, you know, amiable to taking the director's consideration in this regard. The reason we had tentatively reduced that requisition was obviously in respect of the decreased ask from um, the operator DIRA with respect to their operational grant. They did have some one-time costs that were included in last year for some building repairs that obviously were complete and therefore weren't carried into this year. Um, and are barring a you know a fulsome analysis of what would be required to um, you know deal with that 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 building envelope, um, you know we certainly could keep the requisition where it's at and, and put those dollars in reserves. Um, so you know we could certainly consider that. Right, Harvard. Yeah, thanks, Chair, and for the good suggestion. I think uh, your suggestion makes total sense to me and. I think I'd be willing to even move a recommendation, keeping the requisition steady in anticipation of that cost and to stash it and to reserve. It's not a very large amount. And it's actually a pretty soft year for them and um, in terms of tax impact. Um, when we got the BC assessment, they really got hit last year, but this year is is actually Denman's gonna, their share of regional service is gonna go down a little bit. So maybe maintaining the requisition, which provides some seed funding for the service to get going on that building, I, I'm uh, I'm supportive. So unless staff really or SEO has, has a different opinion. Um, just um, Mark's just sharing with me that the building is owned by the school district or is it a society? But none, nonetheless, we had leased it for a dollar a year. So um, maybe we might just want to reflect on this and come back. So uh, may I... I'm not binding us to the building, but if we keep the requisition the same at 22,000 this year, then it's a small reserve. And then um, to respond to anything that might come up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we so can reflect that uh, in the budget yeah. uh, right now. Yeah. Thank you, Chair, for the suggestion. So if, if I could then, based upon what's just been put forward by the CEO, is the building that is being utilized by the service is being utilized for a dollar. So with regards to the, the building itself, wh wh why did we bring up the, the purpose of of the uh, building having to be repaired and, and the cost associated with it if it's not something that really falls on our shoulders? Yeah, through the CAO and through the chair. Uh, sorry, I certainly didn't mean to confuse things further, but um, so the, the way this service works, and it's very similar to Hornby, is um, we contract the service through the Denman Island Residents Association. So they're our contractor, they, they provide the service to us. And in the provision of that service, they've selected this building to run the recycling depot out of, and they lease that building from the school district. It's an old school district property. That surplus and so it's not our building and the roof is leaking and it's a problem and we want to be participate in that repair but we haven't i don't think we've exactly figured out you know whether we would repair that as our own asset you know i don't think we can so we, we need to come up with what that arrangement's going to look like and we haven't done that yet and then for to further complicate things we're we're doing this solid waste management plan review and many of our other Recycling facilities, that service does take a, a role and responsibility in, in maintaining them. So we're, we're looking at that to see, you know, what that looks like. So um, I, I think maintaining the reserve is not a bad idea. It can be used for other things in the future, but just, you know, we're not sure how this roof repair and building repair is going to work out exactly. Yeah, thanks for that follow up and, and the justification. And uh, I still, I guess staff will work on that over the coming year. And I think the 22,000 is could always be used for something else. So there's no love lost. It just keeps the requisition steady for today. 
And in regards to the school, I am amenable to uh, Spain because um, it's the school site, uh, you see, or it's a... Uh, I understand Dira. it's a school district property, property that's been leased for a long time, like yes. a 99-year lease for, for yeah. very low cost. Yeah, that's right. So the capacity of anyone else in the community to come up with those costs and, and that property for the school district would be very low priority. So... I have no problem uh, with us investing uh, in a building on that site because no one else will upgrade it. It's it's an old building, and I, I don't see anyone else but us stepping up. And I can have a touch base with our school trustee about it as well, and I'm sure she'll say, well, I didn't even know that this was cool. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah, thank you for that um, for opening that line of discussion, Chair, and for staff's answer. So. So vote on uh, acceptance of the report. Carried. And there's a vote on the recommendation. The proposed financial plan, but keeping the requisition stand. Second to that. Vote. Carried. Thank you. Move 16. Second. Vivian? Thank you so much. Uh, this last presentation is the Royston Garbage Collection Service Function 366. Uh, the CVRD took over the Royston uh, Roadside Collection Service of Garbage and Recycling uh, from the old, old Royston Improvement District back in 2010. Uh, the revenue for the service uh, is predominantly from user fees uh, offset by re the Recycle BC incentive uh, payments through their Recycling Curbside Collection Program. And uh, MTERA has been the solid waste and uh, recycling curbside pro service provider uh, since February 2018, uh, and the, that contract is set to expire uh, at the end of this year. The Royston Curbside uh, Collection Service, again, is funded through that combination of user fees and the Recycle BC incentives. Uh, the BC Recycle, Recycle BC payment accounts for roughly about 20% uh, uh, of the revenue for the service. Uh, so for 2023, uh, the Recycle BC incentive is estimated at roughly about 45,000, and that is uh, 300, or sorry, 38.65 per household plus uh, $1.75 for administration and education for a total of uh, 100, sorry, 1,134 homes as of January. Uh, this continues to be included as revenue for each year of the five-year financial plan. And then on the expenditure side, uh, the MTERA contract uh, saw a 11% increase um, from 6, 50, uh, 686 per month per household to $7.61 per month per household effective uh, September 20, 22, 2022. Uh, this is, um, we did do a bit of a, just a quick scan across the different municipalities, and this is consistent with uh, the increases that were uh, seen at the, with the Courtney and Campbell River contracts. Um, there it was also a 3.6% increase in TIP fee at the Comox Waste Management Center uh, from the $140 per ton to $145 per ton, which was up, came into effect on January 1st, 2023. And then under the transfer to other functions, there are two line items. Um, the delivery of service, again, for this uh, MTERA contract is overseen by Jesse Lee, our uh, manager of the CSWM operations. Uh, there are no HR components allocated to the service, uh, but there is the $4,000 annual uh, transfer to, to the CSWM function 391 uh, to offset the his time uh, spent in the administration of this contract. And then the balance of uh, $1,182 is the new internal cost of carbon uh, charged out at $160 per ton of carbon or sorry, CO2 emissions as approved uh, through the CBRD SEEP. Uh, this new light item, again, will be used to fund uh, future carbon reduction programs across the CBRD services. 
And finally, there is a $4,000 contribution to reserves. Uh, as I noted earlier, uh, the Royston Garbage Collection Service, or sorry, Curbside Collection Service is, ex is set to expire at the end of this year and staff will be going out to competitive procurement uh, early 2023. Uh, so in advancement of that procurement process, uh, staff will be undertaking um, an engagement process with Royston residents uh, this spring with the goal of engaging uh, public uh, feedback on the future of the curbside collection, collection specifically uh, the direction to either stay manual or to transition to an automated collection service and uh, secondly the inclusion of organics uh, so that's food and yard waste uh, with the commissioning of the regional organics uh, facility uh, which currently only includes four core municipalities uh, at this time so Colmox, Cumberland, Courtney and Campbell River Anecdotally, through phone calls and uh, social media inquiries, uh, there's been a lot of interest from Royston residents um, for this service. Um, and then, as you know, with kitchen scraps uh, tossed in the garbage or the landfill where it eventually ends up, uh, it will undergo anaerobic digestion, decomp decomposition, um, which results salts in the, harm the generation of harmful gases um, like methane, carbon dioxide, uh, ammonia, organic acids, and heat. Uh, so one of the greenhouse, again, as you know, the, one of the greenhouse gases that is um, top of mind is generation of methane. So what we really do want to do, uh, having gone through the waste composition study, um, we found that roughly about 30% of the garbage that is tossed out at the curb is made up of about 30% of food waste. And we want to send that material to the CSWM uh, Regional Organics Facility. Um, yeah, again, the landfill is a valuable resource for our community and it's an incredible asset. So we want to be able to expand this uh, to single family homes where we have the greatest uh, feedstock confidence at this time as we can, or we're commissioning this facility um, with the expectation that this will help increase our diversion rate. Uh, for the service. So as we look to the future of the service, uh, it would be prudent for us to include a provision in this new contract for the re removal of organics uh, from the waste stream for single family dwelling for the service. And in anticipation of these pending changes, uh, it is recommended that the user rates um, uh, are increased by about 15,000 in 2023 in, from the 2022 budget. And the proposed increases are, are on a per household basis uh, for the preceding years are shown in this slide. Um, so we're hoping to be able to, the proposed rates for 2023 is uh, anticipated to go up to $133 per household um, and 138 in 2025 and then 143 for 2026 and 27. Is that for me? Thanks, what a great service. And um, whenever I talk to people in, in area A that are not serviced <laughs> through the Royston service, they're kind of stunned. What do you mean $133 for two months? No, per year, for three months, no, per year. <laughs> and you get recycling and garbage pickup. And, uh, you know, it's just such a great value. Um, I did my uh, only comments for today, obviously fine with the budget for this year, but, um, one is uh, one where I'm not seeing it. Um, I'm not sure if there's been follow up, but there's still the people in Spence Road that would like to be added to the service. And I think they had communication with uh, the CVRD like a year ago. And I know we have, we still have the hangover from our garbage and recycling referendum, but uh, service expansion, I think, is still in, in quite possible in area A. And I remember at the time there was an option for uh, directors to just sign under the legislative act to expand um, service or to create service. And I'm not sure about Fannie Bay, but um, if staff is interested this year in looking at Union Bay, Spence Road area, and maybe all of Union Bay, I believe from going door to door that there is a lot of people want to see that and uh, there's been rate increases and the rest of it ever since the referendum and uh, I could potentially spend a little bit of political capital if I if I talk with people and felt this was really supported to um, to add Union Bay um, onto the garbage and recycling and I'm talking about that because we are considering a renewal of procurement which leads me to my second topic um, which is I really hope we'll do strong social procurement 
and or I think a year ago with our CEO, we we're talking, or I was talking anyways, but uh, is this something that we could experiment and bring it in house? Do we have to contract it out? Could we have a small public service? Denman Island is providing garbage pickup and recycling quite well. There's the truck runs, uh, all the rest of that. So I don't know if we want to necessarily contract it out or start initiate what could eventually become a, a broader uh, pitch to everybody. Uh, so I don't know if we have, or at least have the uh, broad brush option. <laughs> okay, if you want to go public and you want internal, it would be twice the price. So uh, have some legitimate argument for why we need to contract this out. And second, for the contract itself, we've been with MTRI with a long time. I, I I don't have a lot of concerns, but what I hear from people, you know, you have Strathcona, you have other people that could bid on this. So uh, strong social procurement and some of the things that we were looking at doing in the garbage and recycling when we we're going to put out the contract for the areas, I'd like to see that it can favor local ownership, all these different things or other goals, either on the uh, reduction side, levels of service, all the rest of it. I think we want to see some really great proposals. I'm throwing a lot at you right now, but I don't know if there's any feedback. I just thought I'd share it because I realize this year is, a, is an important one. Is, is the procurement horizon like five year contract or 10 years contract or three years contract? Um, Mr. Chair, just the, the final question Director Arbor asked about the, the length of the contract, that specific, but also he was just alluding to a lot of options. And I'm wondering to what extent, um, Vivian, you could talk about the solid waste management plan, looking at those options and, and to what extent was this matter, rural collection going to be part of that process? Thank you so much for the question. The, as you mentioned, there was a bit of a hangover from last year, or sorry, the 2021 AAP process. Uh, we are still obviously hearing a lot from uh, residents in the rural areas. Uh, there's been increases that um, are being passed um, for some of the other contracting services. And uh, yeah, we get those phone calls every day. So it is definitely very much top of mind. Um, but also respecting the the feedback that we heard through the AAP process, we we do need to, well, we strongly believe that it was a service that is um, would definitely have been great, offered great value to CBRD or electoral area residents. It is something that we do, do need to take into consideration in the development of a, a future service and what could it potentially look like under the solid waste management plan. Uh, what we do essentially want, we we would love to be able to do through that sir, through the solid waste management plan is to be able to provide uh, a broad access to affordable access uh, to all area residents. Um, but we are going to be undertaking that uh, that review under the solid waste management plan, and what that would look like, whether it's um, yeah, there are a few different options. I don't want to get ahead of ourselves yet. We do want to present these options uh, to the advisory members, but. First, um, but there are a few different uh, suggestions that we could potentially pose uh, where we can be able to provide much more cost-effective uh, service delivery. Um, to some of your other questions, um, uh, we are for Spences Road. There are there is a, a, a process to go through for the inclusion of service, but one of the the biggest challenge was the the current uh, contract, knowing that we were up for uh, renewal or not renewal uh, a new procurement process. Uh, the timing just wasn't great, but through this process we could look at um, what that expansion could look like. Uh, working with the legislative services team, where well, we can get to you get back to you in terms of. Uh, what the process will we can lay out what that process will be um and then in terms of the in taking the service in-house um for uh, such a small service area uh it is we have taken an an internal review of exercise of what that would look like it's it's more than just a pickup truck and the collection of service. Uh, to your point about uh, the Denman service, it is contracted out to Strathcona Waste Management Service, if I recall correctly. Um, so it uh, yeah, it is a much broader service than just the Denman area. Um, and there are a lot more considerations beyond, because we don't have a public works yard, for example. Uh, it is something that um, isn't necessarily cost effective for just 1,100 residents. Um, we could uh, I'll look to the CAO to see if it was something that we want to bring a report back on um, for a future date. 
Um, Mr. Chair, my advice would be considerations of options for rural service be driven through the solid waste management plan. Then the analysis and work is done in the interests of all the service areas rather than duplication. Mm -hmm. And I think that was our initial intention as a response to the failed referendum was to, to look at that because it may also be the means for us to, to implement rural service delivery as opposed to having to rely on an AAP. So my suggestion is evaluating the options that Director Arbor has, has mentioned in the interests of all the areas that won't, then won't duplicate the, the work because we've got a fairly extensive workload this year just to, to complete the solid waste management plan. So before going to uh, Director Edwin, Daniel, you had a follow-up question? Yeah, just a follow-up comment, maybe. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, that's fair. I, I guess my my only uh, concern is, um, I mean, it, it's just the reality of the business we're in as elected official is um, the start of a term is a, is a good time to do changes. And if the solid waste management time spills into year three and year four, it becomes much harder to make decisions because the public pressure is elevated. And um, so I'm just saying, um, I, Spence Road would be wonderful if we're able to include them in the procurement process. I hear appetite from people from moving forward. People are still asking questions and it wasn't a failed referendum. It was a failed AAP process. And I fully own that one. We fully own that one as Dr. Except Dr. Hardy was on the table for doing that process. But we also know there was 70, 72% support for a pickup service when we did our survey. So uh, we are le really leaving people in the lurch and, and I, I continue to hear about it. So uh, so it's fine, solid waste management plan. And uh, and I also hear about the comments that um, uh, going in house, so maybe not, don't spend time on that. I think those comments were sufficient for, for me for today. Um, I, I think that's also the kind of thing that could come out of solid waste management plan if the entire region wanted to create a public service for pickup. Thanks. And just to clarify my comments too, I don't mean to discourage if there are neighborhoods that are a natural extension to the existing service, by all means, we can process those. Those don't have to wait to the solid waste management plan. We did that recently as an extension to, to Royston. So uh, neighborhoods can petition us and we can expand that area through a petition process that is still open to the public and we'll look into the Spence Road example for sure. Edwin. Thank you. I think it, it's it, the best way forward is to uh, highlight the service as a poster child of what could be done in the rural areas. I know they got on early on board with the MMBC, Recycle BC, so they actually got the contract, I think, before Comox even joined. Uh, so, uh, you know, 1,100 odd homes and, and they're getting their service for 133.64 a year. And I was paying $183 every three months for one pickup, no recycling. So I think it's it uh, people aren't exactly stupid, even if they are sometimes clumsy that uh, if they look at this, they'll realize that, oh, geez, maybe that wasn't such a bad deal after all. And just as a little aside, um, I would remind the directors and the presenters and staff that the microphones have to be within about three inches of your mouth. I see them over here. I see them down here. And, and I'm sorry, I'm getting old and deaf. I can't hear you. Any other comments, questions? So uh, vote on acceptance of the report. Carrie. Recommendation. Vote on the acceptance of the recommendation. Okay. Carried. Thank you, Vivian. Moving into 17, the Hornby Comfort Station Service, function 688. Move it. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you very much, directors. And uh, Mark Harrison is here to present this budget and the three recommendations and answer any of your questions. Thank you, Russell. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, the uh, January 30th uh, Electoral Area Services Committee meeting, the directors did ask staff to further explore the proposed budget for Function 688, which is the uh, Hornby Island Comfort Station Service and to uh, specifically explore the possibility of funding the Little Tribune Bay Cover Station Capital Works project with community works funds. Um, first off, staff did confirm that the uh, that project 
uh, is eligible under the Community Works funds. Um, and now, secondly, what staff did is they we looked at uh, $20,000 in Community Works funds and then how we were going to be able to still fund the future um, potential capital works within the five-year plan. And, um, you know, without the community works funds, we were proposing 17,500 increase each year, uh, 38,000. Yeah, if we, if the directors want to support um, $20,000 contribution in community works funds towards a little Tribune Bay project, then staff are proposing a $7,000 increase. So that would be to 27,500. Um, just with a with note that at the end of the five-year project, if there is a capital project uh, in year 2027, that the reserves will still be fairly minimal. Um, the other option is you could um, keep the requisition as is at 20,500 um, with the community works funds, but we won't be able to support any capital works in the future. So happy to answer questions if you like. Thanks to staff. That's perfect. Uh, I think that's great approach. And maybe in five or six years, the future director will decide to throw another round of community works funds for the, for the project. I was in Ottawa, and the, the minister that met with uh, Director Grieve and the chair and uh, staff, Minister of Rural Forum, was talking about community works fund, and they're only concerned for um, you know not increasing the amount of money that's given to communities um, is that they don't get enough acknowledgement. Um, because nobody knows that government of Canada. So maybe we can invite the minister to the uh, little trip uh, outhouse. Uh, <laughs> but uh, jokes aside, I think that's um, that's a good use of funds that will be um, uh, recognized in the community. And second, for the some of those future projects, maybe in the next couple of months, I might ask staff for a little bit of support. Talk to a co co-op board member again this weekend on RB um, around their project around a public facility, public washroom facility or in the uh, four corners area. And uh, and also the design, the future design. And and uh, and obviously they 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 are wondering if the CVRD will be able to support. I know there's a committee through HIRA as well that uh, may or may not be fully plugged into those conversations. So uh, but for today, your solution is great. I support the 7,000, which is more reasonable increase, and the community works fund small allocation. That's great. Any other questions? Vote on accept to the report. Carried. Move the three recommendations. Second. Vote. Carried. On all three. Thank you, Mark. Group 551, 556. Five, no point of order. Just stamina. Yeah, sorry, I'll have, uh, I, re I just realized the two reports were put together, but I will have to recuse myself for the Hornby Dev because I have a conflict of interest. So uh, if staff is able to do the Denman one and then piece out the other one after, that would be appreciated. Ken? Doug, can you do that? Doug can do that. I hurt my eyes. Oh, thank you. Through the chair, I'm here to present the uh, Denman Island um, Economic Development Service, uh, Function 555. So Denman Island uh, typically works through this service, uh, looking at some of the works from economic development standpoint through Denman Works, they call themselves. And really, they focus on uh, Hornby and Denman Visitor brochure information as well as their primary function is distributing uh, up to $24,000 in grants uh, throughout their community to support economic activity. Uh, recently, they also have made available to residents a pro-level Zoom account for their affairs there, which has been beneficial. As we move through the work plan priorities, one of the interesting pieces on Denman 
is the new service and the housing support through others. So this was largely brought forward at the board as a principle for provision and capital contributions to the Deming Green project uh, through a bunch of respective services considerations. And it was felt that they best uh, were to be considered in this service. And as such, in the staff report, there's a resolution uh, looking at three different service options for Denman, being a $25,000 contribution, a $50,000 contribution, and a $100,000 contribution in various amounts. Um, if there's any questions regarding this, Kevin and Jake are also here to uh, help me with those questions regarding that housing support through Ford Denman Green. So this is not reflected in the proposed budget of the minor increase of $3,000. So you'll see there that there's a minor increase of $3,000 in operating costs to mostly go towards Denman Works and their services. At this point, I will uh, leave it open to any questions. I just wanted to um, maybe just highlight some of those tables for Denman here. For their housing project before we go into that service. So essentially you're looking at uh, for a 25,000 contribution dollar amount, total impact would be $77. And then up to 147 for a hundred thousand dollar contribution over the five years for cont contributions into that service. So I'll leave it at that. Greg <laughs> Carver. Yeah, thanks, Doug. Uh, really pleased to see uh, Denman Works getting involved with the uh, uh, Denman Green project. It's been uh, quite uh, up and down here for housing on Denman uh, with what happened with the senior center project. And then this great news that the two organizations are now collaborating and have an amazing site um, right downtown, uh, downtown in parenthesis, uh, Denman. And so um, it's nice to see the uh, Denman works and, and also the broader community and ourselves considering um, our role in potentially helping that project get off the ground. So I'm quite amenable to uh, staff bringing back recommendations around um, early capital contributions to that project. And um, and I would also underline that Denman Works was also quite helpful in um, setting up the community bus on Denman and um, <laughs> through various means, it's still, still running and I think it's off the ground and um, so it, it's good to see the work of the organization and the broader community. And I'm, I'm happy with the budget. Thank you. And, and at this time, I'll just remove myself so you can do a horn B and, and the votes. Thank you. Did I want to comment on the Denman budget maybe before you remove yourself? There is a, if the committee wishes, there is a uh, recommendation in the plan to look at that one of those increases uh, for a contrib contribution to Denman Green Project. We weren't planning on coming back with an additional staff report unless directed to do so. So that would be the uh, table here. Oops. It's the bottom table refers to Denman with the $77 would be for the 25%, $25,000 increase to the tax requisition and so forth down to 147 for the $100,000. Jake might want to add a little more. <laughs> yeah, that's what I say. Somehow I missed that when I read the report, my apologies. Um, so basically what you're saying is the $100,000 um, would result in an increase tax impact of 147 for the, the whole service. So probably a hundred dollars more. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, Kevin, Kevin and myself here can address this. Uh, thank you through the chair. Uh, yeah, so that that tax impact is is a contribution on top of the existing service. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, and the existing service probably like fifty bucks or something or thereabouts. Yeah, um, so it's a hundred dollars one time, uh, 
for Denman Knights as contribution, I can back that. So I, I'm, I'm prepared to do the 100,000 uh, if it's supported by the other directors. But I, I would plan on some communication if, if we can do some communication and work with Denman Works and into some little release and some comments for myself because I, I think the whole community will be happy, but I still want to explain it and get our message out there around that one-time contribution. Okay. Thank you, Mr. And just to confirm uh, that uh, this contribution again is, be is being made uh, by the CBRD to the project directly. So as far as the involvement of Denman works in this, th there's not a direct interaction is my understanding. Yeah. Mr. Chair, if there's no other questions, I would suggest voting on receipt of the report. Director Arbor can stay for the resolutions with respect to Denman and then remove himself for the Hornby. It's already moved. Just need to vote on receiving. Okay. Carrie? Move the recommendation for the MECDEV Denman with uh, the $100,000 uh, special requisition. Second. Turn voting on. Then vote second. Okay, so recommendation one. Carried. Yeah, thank you. I'll, uh, I'll remove myself for the Hornby Island EGDEV because I've got a small contract with them. Um, so I, I'd rather just not be involved in any of the decisions. Good enough. Thanks. Thank you. Of uh, frappuccinos, please, when you're coming back. All right. So now we're doing a vote on recommendation number two. Sorry, vote, vote to receive. We did that. Receive both. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, just. Okay. Okay. So I'll, I'll move. I'll move to. Okay. Second. Okay. Then vote. Yeah. Carry. Do you want to get turned for Harvard? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Doug. Good man. <laughs> Move the financial plan to Illinois Arts and Culture Grant Service Function 615 for receipt. Sorry, through the chair, there's a similar recommendation for Hornby regarding the housing contribution uh, separate from the high seek budget that's proposed which is, uh, well, he might want to come in because he's not, okay. No, it's not, that's what I'm saying, Director Arbor might want to come in. <laughs> Sorry for the confusion in this report. <laughs> If they did something similar as they did for Hornby with uh, giving it to the Hornby Island Housing Society a contribution of 100,000, it would be the option three for 100,000 to be plugged into the recommendation for 155.28. Second. Oh. Carrie. Thanks. Now we're on to the parts. We always have it. Now we're on to 19. Yep. And Dr. Mars is here for that one. Thank you, through the chair. I'm here to present the electoral area arts contribution service function. As soon as Lisa has it up here. Let's get started. It's function 615. 
And the purpose here is to provide assistance to the basically the bricks and mortar complexes, plus a few other arts and culture associations through the electoral areas. It should be noted that there's a number of work plan priorities. Well, before we get to those priorities, it should be noted that we have fiscal responsibility, community partnerships and climate change all play a reactive role and active role in this um, service. And your total assessed value of 800,000 would see a tax impact of 832. And uh, one of the interesting pieces here from last year, which is a little carryover from the 2023 work plan priorities, the city of Courtney is working on a art and cultural strategy, mainly involved within their own city limits. But as you recall, last year, you looked at $15,000 to look at the um, limit uh, to contribute to this study. So we're expecting some regional perspective on that. And also noting that in 2023, the art gallery has shifted spaces and provides youth focused media and hands on learning. Um, here's an example of one of the shows they're recently putting on as they're moving towards the digital area of Rosie, it's called down in the middle that looks at, you know, different aspects of the community and that different access to culture. As you heard from the Arts Council a little earlier, there has been quite a shift to digital media. I should also note on behalf of all the organizations, all of them would have been happy to come here and present to you at this time to share what they've done over the years in COVID. But uh, at this time, we thought it's best that the Comox Valley Arts Council just attended. But if you did want any other presentations from any of the people, uh, they'd be happy to come if you let me know. Um, the requisition this year is up to $110,000, remaining fairly steady. And as you saw, a, lot, a big chunk of this increase was for the Arts Council uh, was able to be from surpluses in the prior years to get them up a little bit higher to 9,200. And also a late request came in from HMCS Alberni uh, of a request for 4,000, which is not in this proposed budget. And we'd need a subsequent motion if, if you wanted to include that. So as a reminder here, the uh, recipient agencies, you have the Comox Valley Archives and Museum, the Art Gallery, Courtney District Museum, Arts Council, Cumberland Museum, Sid Williams Theater, the Farmers Markets is still in here, and the City of Courtney Arts Culture, which I mentioned last year, the funding was given to them, as well as the Alberni Project, which is bolded there for the additional 4,000. And the Writers Society uh, didn't request anything this year. Uh, as you may recall, the earlier presentation also looked at another $1,000 increase from the Comox. Valley Community Arts Council for their for their bus upgrades or their art, their rural art bus to go out and establish programs in the community. And that's about it. Any questions on this service? Director Pease. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm wondering if I can ask through the CAO to Kevin. I believe the Alberni project uh, was part of our rural grant and aid at one time. And uh, I can't remember what we gave them last time. It was nowhere near 4,000 bucks. I think it was 2,200. Actually, I might have it on that. You have that one? It's 2,000. It might have been 2021, right? Thank you. Thank you, Chair, for your direct brief. So, yeah, the Alberta Project Society did receive $2,000 in this particular service budget last year. How much? $2,000. $2,000. Yeah. And then, yes, you're, you are correct. In past years, we have at times also provided them dollars in the uh, Rural Community Grant Program as well. Okay. <clears throat> well, I would propose we give them 25 this time. And just a question about the um, the uh, CV Arts. Uh, they wanted five thousand dollars, and they're getting four thousand dollars. Is that correct? Over what we were going to give them? Yeah. So I think they were under the understanding that they were still allocated fifty two hundred dollars, as was last year. We have increased that in this proposed budget to ninety two hundred. So that would be a four thousand dollar increase. I think they were asking for a total of ten thousand two hundred dollars. Yes, I would propose we give them that ten thousand two hundred. 
even though they're not going to come and help me with my Canada Day celebrations this year. I won't hold it against them. Other than that, I mean, when you actually look at this as a long-standing issue with uh, supporting arts and culture, mostly in the municipalities, and this is what we came up with, and it seems to be a drop in the bucket. I mean, in the bigger picture, when you consider what it costs to run the art gallery or the Sid Williams Theatre, but at least we can hold our heads up in the electoral areas and say we're helping out. Thank you. Trek Carver. Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I wouldn't leave it like that, uh, Director Grieve. I think um, I think we we saw a huge transformation of the rural grant uh, program in that we I think we've extended the, our reach in rural areas with nonprofit organization to an extent that we haven't done when I look at this slate of support with the arts uh, contribution service. It's still about 70,000 goes to hard infrastructure in the city of Courtney out of 100,000. If I look at uh, the Courtney and District Museum, I don't see the Union Bay Museum as an amazing little museum. And we're not giving them a cent through this program. And I met with them last year, and they're talking about strengthening their relationship with Commerce First Nation, trying to decolonize a little bit their exhibits. And, and we're not, you know, I don't see it represented here. So I I wouldn't mind, I, it's a bit late in the process, but I wouldn't mind us um, reducing our contribution to Sid Williams and the Courtney and District Museum. And what's the third big one? There was a third one on there. Twenty-six. Um, yeah. Oh, the art gallery, the Comex Valley Art Gallery. Um, and the Cumberland Museum getting six thousand. And again, Union Bay or or some of the places on Hornby and Denman. So actually, Hornby and Denman don't contribute. So let's leave the, those out. But uh, I, I don't think we've nailed it yet in terms of allocating resources from our rural areas in a better balance. I'd love to see. Uh, the split a little bit in the favor of organizations in the communities or for projects like these guys presented when they have a clear projects that will um, uh, spread out a little bit outside that would be great um yeah that'd be my comment so not for this year but maybe we can have a touch base of strategic planning for electoral area on this just a little item and we can discuss it and if there's support maybe we can change the tack a little bit Treasury um, fee? $8.32 on an $800,000 assessment. I don't think it's going to break the bank. I know um, that our, our rural community grants um, are have, a, have a little different focus, and that's why we split them up. But yeah, I would, uh, I, I would pretty well maintain a status quo with it with a few exceptions that I mentioned. So do we want to vote on the uh, reception of the uh, report? Carried. Vote on receive of recommendation. I'll vote. May, may I, I would propose that we vote on the recommendation, uh, including the Alberni Project Society for $2,500 and increase the uh, Mux Valley Arts Council to $10,200. 10, Carried. So vote on acceptance. Sorry. Did vote on the recommendation. Thank you. Okay. Nope. Sorry, new business. Do we have new business? You're right. We do have new business. Because that was yesterday. Nope. Yeah. Uh, a report on who's doing something. Yeah. 
And just for the record, Vivian doesn't have control over Skyrocket. Chris does. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so new business? Yeah, so the new business, I think we had a request for um, for us to send a, a letter to uh, what, what I would suggest is the board ask for staff report that clarifies the requests of Couscousum yes. and the participating services that would be providing in kind and bring that report back to the EA. Second, I mean, I move what Russell said. What he said. Second. <laughs> Second. Carrie, thank you. No, I got a vote. Oh, sorry. Vote. Thank you. Carrie. So okay. no new business, no addendums, no media questions. So nope. we're moving into in camera. Turn off the cameras. Vote. Mm -hmm. vote to go in camera. Based upon section section 90 of the community charter, et cetera. Oh, Carrie. That was 